All right, team, you're now live. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Stratton, and I'm the chair of the Multimodal Commission for the City of Asheville. Uh, it's been a while since we've met, so it's my pleasure to um, uh, call this meeting to order after a few months. Uh, we've got some good work to do today, and uh, we've done some good work in, in over the past few months, and it's nice to get back to an official capacity. Uh, today is uh, June 24th, uh, 2020, and uh, this meeting is officially called to order. Um, the MMTC exists uh, to assist the city in furthering, advancing, and promoting the comprehensive and integrative transportation system um, that incorporates multimodal concepts, including, but not limited to, transit, bicycle, pedestrian facilities, greenways, complete streets, and highways. Um, today, all of our commission members um, and staff are participating virtually uh, due to uh, COVID-19, so we're all staying safe. Um, we appreciate your patience as we work through um, this commission meeting a bit differently than is uh, no normal. Um, we are streaming live via uh, our virtual engagement hub, which is accessible through the virtual engagement hub link uh, on the front page of the city website. Uh, it can also be found on our commission uh, webpage as well. Um, in addition, uh, there's another option to, to listen um, by phone, and you can do that by dialing the number 855-925-2801, and you'll need a code to, to access the meeting, and that code is 9466. Um, so on behalf of um, the MMTC uh, and staff, anybody else that's, that's uh, joining us virtually, we'd like to welcome you all. Um, so I'm going to... Um, uh, introduce everybody. Um, we're going to do things, like I said, we're going to do things a little bit differently. Uh, so I'll go through the, uh, and introduce each one of our commission members um, who are participating virtually um, and ask them to uh, briefly say hello and um, which uh, interest they, they represent. Um, I'd just like to remind everybody to please mute uh, yourselves throughout the uh, course of this meeting, uh, unless um, you are, are ready to ask a question or, or um, we just want to make sure that we don't have uh, any, any crosstalk with this. Um, so commission members, as I call your name, please uh, say a quick hello and uh, which interest you represent. Vice Chair Medlock. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Medlock and I am also the chair of the transit committee. Um, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Warren. Yeah, I'm Randy Warren and I'm on the bike and pedestrian task force. Thank you. Commissioner Roney. Kim Roney, also a member of the transit committee. Very good. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Armstrong, did he make it in? Yeah, I'm calling in by phone. Hi, Sorry. everyone. Um, I, I I also sit on the Greenway Commission as well. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lee? Hey, Rich Lee, and I sit on the Greenway Committee. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Wenzel? Hi, Dennis Wenzel, and I am a member at large. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Katz? Um, I'm Pat Katz, and I represent, I guess, at large. My, my husband's a big bicyclist, and I did multimodal transportation in Atlanta, Georgia, for 10 years. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sexton. I'm Anna Sexton, and I am the Neighborhood Advisory Committee Liaison to the Multimodal Transportation Commission. Thank you. Uh, and Commissioner Archibald. Uh, Joe Archbald, I'm the Planning and Zoning Liaison for the Multimodal Transit Commission. All right, now, without any further ado, uh, we are going to start with our agenda items. Um, so to help our audience follow along, I'll say each of the sections of the agenda aloud and do a vocal roll call on any vote that uh, we'll need to take. Uh, additionally, I'll ask the commission members to raise their hands to speak, uh, and I'll call upon them. Um, so the first thing 
Yeah, uh, we're well, gonna we already call, a call to order. So at this point, we're going to move on to um, review and approve the um, the agenda. Uh, do I have a, a motion? I motion to approve. Got a second? I second. Very good. So approved. No, I have comment on the okay. agenda. Go ahead. Hey, I just want a couple of things noted for the record on our agenda today um, and the process of the agenda. I just want to note for the record that we did not have a complete agenda with all the attachments until this morning on Wednesday. The first agenda iteration came out on Friday. We had additional attachments on Monday, Tuesday, and this morning, um, which was not within the 72 hours we're supposed to have the complete agenda. So I want that on record. Um, and I also want to make a uh, something on record about public comment for the meeting, and I don't know where to do that, Michael. So just let me know where to do uh, something on record I want to say about the public comment. Um, okay. Uh, well, uh, do you do you want to make that that comment now? Yeah, I just want to say that I was contacted from a few people. Uh, we did not get the link for public comment until Monday afternoon for the public comment. And then a couple of people I talked to and also myself went to the multimodal page. And I don't know if it was at the bottom, but it wasn't, it was not very prominent. I had a couple of people say they never found it. It finally showed up today on the bottom. So I just want to say we really did not have a lot of uh, time for the public to either email in or, or call in. And when you actually, when you Google searched it, it was very difficult to find. The first time I actually found it was today, a couple hours before this meeting. And I had people contact me saying they couldn't find the, the link. And I don't think I, as the vice chair, got the link until Monday afternoon, almost at four o'clock. Just want to know. Um, and and, I, and I'll, I'll respond to, to that. You know, I, I think this is, this is new for, for, for everybody. Um, so I'm hoping that we can kind of work through some of the kinks as we go through this one. Um, this is the first meeting we've had in months and, and I definitely hear you, but we need to get better at some of this stuff. Um, so hopefully by the next time we can we can have the, the conversation with staff and figure out what, what went wrong and how we can make it better. But I, I, I do agree. Like it was, it'd be nice if we could, we could have this buttoned up a little bit. Um, do we have any additional comments? Okay. So as it is, uh, we have a motion and a second. Is there, I'm sorry, was there anything else? No? Okay. So a motion and a second, and we, uh, we have approved the agenda. Um, we're now going to move on to uh, review and approve of the minutes from our last meeting, which was all the way back on February 26th. 20? Um, Anna, can, can, can I ask you to, to mute, please? Thank you. Um, so do I have a, uh, a motion to uh, approve the minutes from February 26? So moved. Do I have a second? Okay. I second. Do I have any, any comments? Sorry. Well, one more time. Going once, twice. Okay, uh, we are. <laughs> we've approved the uh, the minutes. Um. So at this point, uh, we've got it on the agenda to, to, to have public comment. So I. Can I get some clarification as far as if we if we've got any? Because I know this is a little different than than normal. Michael, this is Amy. Okay. We were told this morning that um, there was no public comment that came in um, online or through emails or voicemails. We okay. Told that morning by staff. And, and that makes sense, you know, regarding what Elizabeth had mentioned just a couple of minutes ago. So we'll, we'll try to work on that. Um, we'd like to get those numbers up um, as far as persist, participation from the public uh, for next time. Um, so moving on, uh, we're going to be looking at new business. Um, so the first item on that list is a review of membership. Um, we also need to appoint our new vice chair uh, as Elizabeth is, is sadly moving. 
uh, will no longer be be with us. Um, uh, Elizabeth, what was the what was the date of your final departure? You're on mute. Elizabeth, you're on mute. Sorry, there yeah, I'm sorry. I'm okay. like, blown up. yeah, sorry. I'm blown up really big because I have this software, so it takes me a minute. Um, I'm actually gone. I'm in Greenville, South Carolina. I already moved. <laughs> okay. Well, so, I, yeah. guess the, I guess the, the, the question would be, what's the, yeah. the effective end date of your, of your position on, on MMTC? It was technically, I resigned as of June 30th. I submitted okay. a resolution letter. So this is okay. technically my last meeting. Okay. So effective June thirtieth, we're no longer going to be um, uh, Elizabeth's no longer going to be with us. So we're going to need to replace the the vice chair. Um, and then in addition, um, we also need to figure out where some of our folks are going to go, because um, as you know, uh, the I think one of the nice things about MMTC is that while we all serve on on this commission, uh, many of us serve on uh, separate committees. Uh, so we can get even closer to the issues. Um, so we, ideally, everybody on this um, commission will, will have a, an interest that they represent. Um, so right now, it's my understanding that um, we've got Dennis, that um, he was seated kind of in, in, in a limbo phase when we we're first entering into to all this. Uh, we never had an opportunity to figure out where, where you wanted to, to go, Dennis. Um, did, did, did you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I believe there was some discussion through email uh, about the Greenway Committee. Okay, very good. That'd be great. Um, well, that seems easy enough. Uh, do we have any comment on, on that? Okay. Um, well, if, with no comment, uh, do, I, do I need to do a motion on this or do we, do we vote on this? Okay, Jessica's saying no, um, so we're- I don't, I don't need to. Okay, um, then uh, there you go, Dennis, you're on, on Greenways. Great, thank you. Awesome, that's a good one. Um, and we've actually got a, an update uh, by Lucy today on some of the Greenway projects that uh, are going on, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, is there anybody else that, that needs placement? Have we- uh, that, that we've discussed, um, anybody? Okay, uh, that was the Dennis was the only one to my knowledge, but I just wanted to, to, to double check on that. But if if not, we'll, we'll move on to the vice chair uh, position. Um, okay, so as far as the vice chair is concerned, I'd like to say that um, uh, we're going to be we're going to be out quite a bit uh, with with uh, the departure of Elizabeth. Uh, she's been really invaluable over the last couple of months, uh, even as we've not officially met as an official capacity. Um, the ability to to work with, with Elizabeth um, and kind of do a bit of, of, of cat wrangling, I hope nobody takes that as pejorative, but it's, it's kind of been a lot of behind the scenes in a very unorthodox way. Um, and Elizabeth has been really great in, in facilitating that, that help. Um, and we've got a lot accomplished. So they're, they're big shoes to fill, but I know we've got really good folks on this uh, commission that, that, can, that can step up. Um, is there anybody that, that is, is interested at this point or do we have to pick somebody out? Turn on microphone, CTRL plus B. Michael is fabulous to work with. And thank you for that, Michael. But I, but I can say that Michael is a wonderful leader. So um, whoever's in the vice chair seat, I think it's a really good partnership and um, anybody would do a wonderful job. Well, thank you for that. Um, okay, guys, can't we, we can't not have a vice chair. Randy, would you accept a um, nomination? Yeah, I mean, so I, I have my hands in lots of different things, but, um, it, yeah, if if I, I could do it, so, but um, yeah, so I, certainly, you know, like, I don't know if I could be. Beth was really <laughs> you were so active, Beth. It was great. I don't know if I could be quite as active as you were in terms of that, but um, yeah, I, I I could definitely support Michael and and do one extra meeting a month. I think so. Um, yeah, so I'd accept it if, if 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 no one else is 
eager to step forward and, and we need that role full, uh, fulfilled, I could do that. I second that. I second nominate Randy. So nominating Randy. So okay. motion to nominate Randy Warren for the vice chair and thank you for taking on that responsibility since you've been, you'll be able to hold um, some institutional memory as we onboard some new folks. All right, so we've got a motion, we've got a second. Um, any further comment? On the... No? Okay, well, so moved. Uh, welcome, Randy. Congratulations. Um, okay, so I think that moves us through that bullet point. Um, now we're gonna move on to right away closure review of uh, Gale Street. Um, I don't have, I'm not sure who's, who's going to be leading that, who's, who's giving that presentation. Jessica, I think you're on mute Jessica, still. Jessica, you're muted. Sorry. Ugh. Um, okay. So you have, um, as part of your agenda, several attachments that are associated with this right of way request. This request has been um, submitted to the Department of Development Services and it has gone through our uh, technical review committee, which is um, a new step that we implemented, I think back in January, where we have the opportunity for more comprehensive review of these requests. And um, it also, our TRC committee also involves pretty much every department that has anything to do with development applications in general. And so um, part of our part of our process now includes the, the items going to the TRC and then a staff report is written. And when you look at that staff report, you will see um, not only the request, but any comments that might've been made by any of the departments. So this one is being recommended by staff for approval. It's um, essentially closing a, a piece of right of way that is um, non-existent. It, there's no road there currently. It's, uh, I would describe it as kind of a, a, a what's it called? A cul-de-sac that never really was built. And so ultimately the applicant is looking to create a single family home in the area where that piece of right of way is located. And uh, staff does not see any future opportunity for, for any connections, whether that be roadway or greenway or what have you. So we felt that this was one that, um, that could be approved. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. There's, um, the petition is also included as well as the boundary survey. If you want to look, take a look at that as well. Um, but we would be looking for a motion for this. And just as a reminder, the, the commission looks at the right of way closure request and then it gets forwarded to the city council for, uh, review and consideration afterwards. So Jessica, I just wanted to say thanks that the new way it's being presented with the different departments approving or not approving and comments is really helpful because that gives us a better understanding of who's seen it and if there is any issues that we may not see that we can become aware of those. So I, thanks for doing that. Thank you. We, just a note, we still are working on a more, um, not, a, not necessarily a more comprehensive review, but we are still planning to eventually have a, a, a policy update that would include some, some objective criteria. And that's something that's been kind of put on the back burner with COVID, but is, is a part of what we still intend to do and would bring forward to you guys for your feedback. Jessica, um, I've, I've got a question. Um, I actually have a neighbor uh, here in Oakley who has a very similar scenario. Uh, and she's asked me, well, how do I do that? I was like, well, I know we do it, but 
as far as the process is concerned, I'm not exactly sure what or how we go about recommending to our neighbors who might be in the same boat where they go or what to do. Is that, is that something we could guide them through? How do we how do we work on that? Um, so I believe that to apply for a right of way closure, you go to the development services department or pop, or just the website, I believe. Um, there's an application process and there's a fee associated with this request, with these requests. Um, and then it gets scheduled for TRC. But you also have to have, you know, some of the information already as part of your application. So when you submit an application, you have to have your petition. You have to have an affidavit saying that you have gotten approval from your, from the the property owners that are adjacent to the right of way closure. And I believe you also have to have the boundary survey as well. Um, so you have to kind of come to come to the table with that application, including the information. Um, then it goes to TRC for review, and then it comes to multimodal and then council. And there's also um, there's also a public notice requirement that I can't remember exactly all the details, but it gets scheduled for a public hearing and there's a public notice that goes in the paper, um, but that part is handled by um, the clerk's office. So there's steps, but in terms of review, it's it's uh, probably like a two to three month process in normal time. Um, just to try to get on all of the agendas, but right now it's obviously taking us quite a bit longer. Um, and one final follow up on that um, on the petition. I was going through the the, the notes that were um, attached. Um, I didn't, uh, is there any specific number of, of names on that petition you have to have, or is it just just the the parties of interest? I believe it's just the parties that are adjacent to the closure, because okay. we want to make sure that any abutting property owner is okay with it. We want to make sure that we're not closing off access to anyone's property. Um, okay. Well, I appreciate that. Um, that's. You know, I, I'm still relatively new on this board, uh, so I, I'm still going to ask a lot of questions. Um, but I, I know there's other folks out there that have the same questions, so it's probably a good thing. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, so does anybody have any any comment on this particular uh, right of way? And I hope everybody had an opportunity to review the notes. Okay. Motion to approve. Okay, do I have a second? A second that. Okay, very good. Um, without any objection or, or so moved. Okay. Uh, so the motion to, um, to recommend closure of the Gale Street right of way or a portion of, of said right of way uh, has passed. Uh, Michael. Yes, Michael. I think you need to do since this one actually is a motion. You have to do a roll call vote. Oh, very good. Yeah. Right. So everybody sure. has to say yay or nay. Okay. So that it's recorded. That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, let's go through this. Um, so uh, we'll do a roll call vote on the motion to approve the recommendation to close uh, the right of way on. Uh, was that Gile Street? Um, Gale yeah. Street. Um, so, Vice Chair Medlock? Yes. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Rooney? You're, uh, you're muted. Voting yes. Okay, that's a yes from Commissioner Rooney. Uh, Commissioner Warren? Uh, yes, vote to approve. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Armstrong? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Lee? Yes. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Winsel? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Katz? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Sexton? 
Do I technically vote since I'm ex officio? That's that's correct. Okay. Uh, and then so goes for um, uh, Commissioner Archibald as well. Um, so it looks like uh, the votes for in favor of this uh, to close the right of way on Gale Street uh, to recommend that it be closed uh, has passed. Okay. Uh, so we're moving on. Uh, the next bullet point that we're going to look at is the uh, budget update uh, for the city and transit. Uh, and that's going to be by Jessica. Sorry, I'm muted again. Um, so this presentation was uh, created by the finance department and was presented at the May 20th meeting. So it's not it's not all the most to date information. Um, and there might have been a budget presentation last night. I'm I'm actually not quite sure, but I just wanted to go over the first maybe 10 slides or so just so you guys can get an idea of what what's going on with the city budget. Um, the second half of the presentation here was uh, the original city manager's proposed budget, which is no longer relevant at this point. Um, and I also want to note that the schedule for the budget uh, has also been changed. And um, you can find all budget information, including current schedules on the city website under budget process. Um, but Amy, if you could just go to the next slide. So um, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so the, um, the budget schedule, like I said, has been, has been updated. Last night at the city council meeting, there was a interim budget passed, and that was actually just for the month of July. Um, so one of the reasons for doing so is that we we need to have an have a budget for July so that we can continue to operate. However, at the same time, given the uncertainty that we're in right now, as well as the lack of current um, revenue information we didn't want to pass a full budget without having that information. So the, the plan essentially is we have an operating budget for the month of July. Towards the end of July, the council will come back with an, another interim budget essentially. Um, and, um, if, and Gwen, I don't know if you're listening, but if I say anything wrong, let me know. <laughs> But I believe we'll come back in, in the end of July with another budget um, that would include any um, tax rate increases, if there are any. And then um, in September would be a final budget for fiscal year 21. And um, part, of the, part of the issue that we face, and you can uh, go on to the next slide, Amy, is that we we don't get a lot of our revenue information until sometimes one or two months after that money was actually spent. And in the case of sales tax in particular, that which is a significant portion of the city's budget, we don't get the information on how much sales tax was made in the month of March until perhaps like May or June. And so when you have such a significant part of your budget that relies on on sales tax, um, we, you know, we don't want to make any any assumptions really about what that's going to look like since we really don't don't know exactly. Um, but we are, um, you know, we have every department has made cuts to their FY21 budget. We um, were asked to take at least a 6% cut from what we had proposed for FY21. And so all of the all of the departments have made cutbacks, and so we are, um, you know, focusing those cutbacks on things that will have minimal or no impact to the community um, in terms of services. So um, 
you know, we are expecting to get state and federal support related to COVID, and we have gotten some of those funds already, but we still are expecting in several areas of the city budget to have to dip into reserve, um, which we call fund balance. So if you would go to the next slide, Amy. So these slides here are um, about the current year budget that we're in that's ending essentially next week. But um, we've had significant loss from sales taxes, from the um, alcohol sales taxes and um, investment earnings. But we have with those cuts, we have identified savings that have helped reduce that, that loss. Um, there's an expectation that we will have to dip into potentially as much as four and a half million dollars in our fund balances across the city. Um, and again, this is from um, about a month ago, so there might be some slightly new numbers, but um, our available fund balances will drop between 14 and 16 percent. Go to the next slide. So again, sales tax is one of the biggest the biggest um, hits that we're expecting to take for, for obvious reasons. And um, there's an expectation that we could, in the month of March, our sales tax revenue likely took a 15% hit and in April, probably a 30% hit. Um, and as you see right under that, it says when sales tax revenue is received, the March, we, we may have already gotten that now that we're in mid-June but we won't get April until July. And then we also have to wait for May and June until we have a clear picture of what the impacts are gonna be on that. Um, and I would just, I would also note that, you know, the state has been working with all of the jurisdictions on, on revenue estimates and the state, the state as a whole likely won't see as much of a sales tax impact as, as Asheville will because of the high visitation, the high tourism that we have here are um, that has a, a large impact on our sales tax revenue. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we are expecting to get some assistance from the state and the federal government. Uh, we have gotten some funding from the state that came down. It was actually allocated to Buncombe County and Buncombe County asked the city to submit an application, so to speak, to receive a portion of the funds that they received that was submitted and approved. And so we will be getting $942,000 from the county um, for, for assistance. And I believe that much of that funding is going to help offset um, revenue losses, potentially some expenses related to COVID-19. But I also know that we're looking to try to get some reimbursement for FEMA as well, which is an arduous and long process. And, and we don't really know um, when and if FEMA money might, might um, help us. But um, that is something that we're also working on. And then, um, of course, I'm sure everybody has heard about the CARES Act funding. And we did receive 615000 in community development block grant funds through the CARES Act, which is great. I believe that um, a significant portion of that has been allocated towards rental assistance. And I also believe that a portion of that has been allocated to um, the funding of the of the use of the Harris Center and also a lodging facility that was used to house some of our um, homeless individuals in the city. And then um, the COVID, uh, we had the CARES Act provide some, some money for transit which I have a presentation on a little bit later with a lot more detail on that. And then we also got um, $153,000 for police department expenses through the Department of Justice. Next slide, please. Um, so, so enterprise funds, we have two enterprise funds in the transportation department. We have parking and transit. 
again, I'll talk um, about transit a little bit more later, but we definitely had a hit to our revenue in both of these enterprise funds related to COVID-19. Um, as you're aware, we we suspended parking fees in our garages on street and our monthly parking permit. I believe that was in mid-March. And so between all of those revenue sources, um, we get between $500,000 and $600,000 a month. So that is, um, is causing us to have to dip into our, our, our reserve, our fund balances um, in parking. And we, we likely will, let's see, expected fund balance to 1.4 million. Yeah, so I believe we had about 2 million in our fund balance for parking. And so we are, are definitely going to be down to um, a much lesser amount, but I don't have an updated number at this point. I can send that out to you guys. Um, and, you know, just for, just so you know, like parking fund balance, what we use that for is for large scale maintenance projects to our garages, or if we want to buy new parking meters so that we can expand or replace we want to be able to keep a healthy reserve on hand so that we have the ability to do those things. And so having to dip into our fund balance is not not um, not great, but it's, it's good that we have it at this point. Um, I think one more slide, Amy. Right, so this is just a summary of everything I just talked about and um, the rest of this presentation, again, is not is not really relevant any anymore at this time because um, it was talking about the city manager's proposed budget, which has been postponed. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, but I'll, I'll let others go first. I do have a number of questions. This is Kim. Um, so the first one was, what I didn't see in here was reflected whether or not there was an increase or a decrease in um, spring expenses for paratransit. Um, there was a decrease. So we had a, we had a decrease in our paratransit expenses because there was much less use. But we don't know what that number is. I don't know it off the top of my head, but I will make a note and I'll send it to the group. Thank you. Um, what were the payments from the city to RAP PDEV for this spring? So I'm specifically looking to see if we can get a list of payments to this group as a monthly comparison from February all the way through June. Because I know we didn't pay for service hours unless we did for to not when we weren't running the 170 S3 and S2. Um, so if this group could be presented with a cost savings and if that's folded into the one million in savings that were on that slide or if it's separate or different. It would be separate. Um, so, and I can talk about this more in the CARES Act presentation, but we did, so when we did suspend service on various routes, um, we, we, normally would not pay for those hours. So any trip that's missed, um, any revenue hour we that is missed, we don't pay for. However, with the CARES Act funds, that is, that's the primary purpose of the CARES Act funds is to continue to pay for um, the portion of, to pay for those missed hours so that folks that are the drivers, supervisors, dispatchers, maintenance folks, like that they don't have to dip into their paid time off to use that, um, but to use their paid time off or get furloughed. So what we did was any hours that were missed were separated from the normal monthly invoice. And then we had a separate invoice for the hours that were missed. And we use, we've been using the CARES Act money to fund those missed hours. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that 
in the next presentation. Thank you. That relates to another one of my question because we don't have um, clear numbers for this. So if we paid um, the management company for COVID related time off, so it didn't go to their PTO, then that creates a lack of transparency and it looks like a large corporation is just taking care, like advantage of CARES Act funding. So that is still like a concern that we need to look at. Um, this is obviously something that the transit committee could dig more into. Um, but I know that while we're talking about what investments need to be made, as we're, there are a lot, many calls to defund um, the police department, that we know that um, the Better Buses Together group and the Riders Assembly have been partners in understanding where budget priorities need to be. Riders have explained for years that transit can't wait. Necessity bus riders are ready to see action. And um, so we still need, we're still hearing the need for evening service hours. I'm going to tell this story with the consent of the um, rider that it involves. Um, when we cut the 170 service because of the January 1st changes, Spruce Hill Apartments didn't have bus service for weeks. So a neighbor that has served on the transit committee didn't have bus service and then for the first three weeks couldn't get a cab. So it was paying $25 to a neighbor one way to pick up groceries and to pick up prescriptions. So I just want for this group to understand that um, when we're cutting service to entire routes like the 170 and the S3, that can't happen again. Um, it's not safe to not have access to groceries and prescriptions. It's not safe to lose your job because the bus stopped running. It's not safe to walk or bike home when we don't have written consent to search that only protects the drivers of cars. It's not safe to have to choose between getting groceries or getting home. Um, this is a matter of public safety, and it's another reason bus drivers have repeatedly asked to prioritize evening service hours. So um, as the city is looking for solutions and claiming to want to hear voices that aren't being heard, consider listening to the bus drivers who've lifted up their voices time and again for years. Because if we're going to make excuses and um, have a lack of accountability in the transportation department or creating and maintaining capacity issues and not fighting for our own department over the years, it is all under the umbrella of a word of complacency. So we have some solutions holding the management company contract accountable. If we don't have the buses we need to run the 170, which has been given the excuse of being one of the highest ridership, but that doesn't line up with what we know from our stats, um, then we need to rent them. Um, if compensation and benefits are not enough to retain our staff because they are frontline and um, really urgent workers in our community, then we need to renegotiate the contract to address their benefits. Um, this is an opportunity to further collaborate with the county, so we should use it. And if these things aren't doable, then just know that you have the support of thousands of people who are ready for you to take some risks and get public about asking for help. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to switch gears and um, ask for a little bit more detail on the 153,000 that was spent um, for, or that was, delivered from DOJ to, to the APD. Um, well, can you just give us some more detail on what that was and why and how? I actually don't think about it. I'm not familiar with, with it. Um, I'm not sure if Gwen has any information on that, but I can, if not, then I can um, request some information on that and send that out to you guys as well. Yeah, I can't. I can't remember off the top of my head what it was. I think it was. Um, I think it was for personnel costs. I don't. It, it, I don't. I don't believe it was equipment or anything like that. It was more for um, you know to support overtime and those kind of things. Um, I, I, but I do believe it was also for PPE for them. So it was that kind of equipment, but not you know police. Did police. Did we get anything for our firemen for PPE? I mean, I'm just wondering, like, why it was specific. Yeah, 153,000 was related to police. Okay. Um, well, I've I've asked for this um, in the background, uh, and I'll do it on, on public record at this point. I, I would really like to invite uh, a member of the APD to come to one of our, our meetings, hopefully our next one. Um, so these are the type of questions we'd like to, to ask and inquire about. And as far as the purview of why it would make sense to have APD at, at one of our meetings, 
Um, we have, um, we're notorious in this city for being, you know, really, it's just a very dangerous place to, to be if you're a pedestrian or a bicyclist. Um, so if we're, our community is actively asking our police force to consider new ways to engage with the community and be more community centric, I think them coming and talking to us and, and, and kind of going back and forth about what, what that could look like would be of value. So can we make that happen? <laughs> I can attempt to make that happen. Yeah, I think, um, Jessica, if you could, if you could just let Deborah Campbell know, I mean, because I think this would be a discussion in uh, conversation with this whole reimagining the police department um, with the effort to defund how, where traffic falls into that work. I mean, honestly, I, I would, I, I, from every study and report that I've ever seen, when you pull a police officer out of a, a cruiser, you know, uh, where they've got the windows up and the air conditioned blasting and they have no contact with their fellow citizen, that's not ideal. What is ideal is when we can get cops on the beat going down the sidewalk and interacting with, with their community one on one. That's very helpful. And I'd like to know, you know, what steps we're taking to, to get to that. Uh, I also know that it's really helpful for traffic calming. If I, and I noticed that there was hundreds of bicycles that the, the, the APD owns. I've never I've seen a few of them out and about. I didn't realize we had that many. But how nice would it be if we had uh, you know officers on, on bicycles going down the roads in 25 mile an hour zones to keep traffic calm? Nobody's going to um, tailgate a cop like that. So there's 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 different ways that I think we could utilize our, our police at this point, and I think that's within the purview of defunding. Okay. Okay. Any okay. Other cool. Um, Jessica, are you oh, are you are you good? Yeah, I just wanted to mention there's um, another attachment called sales tax just disbursement info. And um, that's just more for your reading pleasure if you'd like. And it talks about the different um, the different tax taxes and how they're dispersed. Michael had asked me previously about how our property tax, I'm sorry, our sales taxes are are dispersed here. And um, long story short, essentially any sales tax that's collected in the in the county um, goes every all sales tax goes directly to the state, and then the the state disperses um, sales tax that was that was uh, collected in the county to the county. Then the county determines how they want to disperse sales tax revenue to the jurisdictions within it. And there's two methods that can be chosen by the county, and they have the ability to make um, to change how they do it once a year. Our our county does it by um, distributing it based on tax value. So you can either distribute it based on population or you can distribute it based on tax value. And here um, in Buncombe, we get ours based on tax value, which um, Taylor Floyd told me that it would, it would appear that that would be less beneficial to us, but I think that the need to have that be the method because it also provides to the um, to the school district and also to um, um, what other district? Sorry, I'm looking at his email. Fire, um, fire, fire! Right, thank you. So um, if it were done based on population, then 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 they would not get that disbursement. So that's how, how it's done here. Um, and then the next, the next presentation, and so if we can bring that one up. And this is specifically about transit, the transit funding that we were prepared back. 
Um, so I, I just want to give you back an overview of the CARES Act, talk to you about what we spent on that money so far and what we expect to spend on that money. And then we can talk a little bit about the remaining funds. And um, and I also have an update on a bill that unfortunately was passed yesterday um, and is going to the governor's desk for some uh, major impact on our CARES Act on our CARES Act funds. Next slide. So thankfully, the CARES Act included a, a decent amount of money for transit. Uh, 25 billion nationwide, and it was distributed to the various agencies using the same formula um, for distribution that our 5307 funds are are distributed on. Our 5307 funds are our urban operational funds, or I'm sorry, operations and capital, and and that distribution formula formula is essentially population based. So. Um, out of that 25 billion, the region as a whole, um, so not just us, but Buncombe County, Henderson County, Haywood County, there was about $8.7 million that was received in the region. And our share of that was about $3.68 million. Um, one of the great things about the CARES Act is that there is no match requirement. So typically our 5307 funds are um, an 80-20 split, meaning that um, we have to pay for 20% of, of the cost. But with the CARES Act funds, there is no match requirement, which is extremely helpful. Um, basically, there, there really is no um, restrictions on how this money can be used, it, which is also a good thing for us. Um, we can use it for operations. We can use it for capital expenses. Really, the only actual restriction is that it can only be spent on an expense that occurred after January 20th. And that date is the date that there was the first official case of a COVID confirmed in the United States. And I believe that was in Seattle. Um, obviously, I think there was probably cases before that now that, that we know, but as of um, as stated in the CARES Act, anything that, that was paid for after January 20th is eligible. Um, so even though there's no restrictions, the CARES Act uh, really focuses on two things as being intended, what this money was intended for. And the first thing is any kind of equipment and supplies related to COVID. So um, obviously PPE, uh, cleaning supplies, those kinds of things were, were a primary intent. And then also in the CARES Act, it talks a lot about how um, we, needed to, we need to use the CARES Act funds to continue to pay frontline staff. And it specifically talks about how the money is intended to be used to, to continue to pay those staff so they, if there are cuts to service, which I think pretty much every transit agency across the country experienced and had, had to have cuts to service, um, that those, those folks would not be penalized. They wouldn't have to be furloughed. They wouldn't have to use their paid time off. Um, if they had to cut back service hours. So um, as I mentioned previously, that is something that we've continued to do. We, we did have to cut service hours and, um, and the, the reason for that is primarily that there's a lack of drivers and the lack of drivers is something that we've struggled with nationwide, including here. And, um, but we and we also had um, further loss of staffing levels because specifically because of COVID, whether that was someone that was having symptoms and needed to, to not work or needed to take care of 
um, a child or a family member that was ill or or needed to take care of a child because we didn't have school anymore. Um, so, so that is definitely something that we experienced here. Um, and then, and then another great thing about this funding is that there is no deadline to spend it technically, but it does say in the act that the the funding is is intended to be used quickly, quickly. So, um, that's that's the summary of that. Is there any questions before I move on? No. Okay. So next slide, Amy. Thank you. So this is what we have spent so far. Um, we we spent um, obviously we spent money on cleaning supplies and cleaning equipment. We spent money on PPE um, and we spent money on printing for signage and and you know information related to the pandemic. Um, and we've actually spent more than that on on cleaning products and such. But um, some of that has been, um, some of those purchases were made by RATP Dev and some of them were made by us. So um, we also have placed orders for about, well, we've encumbered about $500,000 worth for, to purchase, design, and install the barrier doors for all of our buses. We have 27 buses. And um, we have placed all of those orders. We're currently um, setting up contracts with installers. And so I think that it, it's ending up being less than $500,000, but I don't know exactly what it's gonna be yet, but that's what we wanted to ask council to approve so that we could get started placing those orders and getting the ball rolling. Um, without having to keep going back to them um, for, with updates. But it's likely that we will be spending less than that on the barrier doors. Um, and then we also, to try to offset the lack of drivers and the service cuts, um, as well as the overcrowding issue that we've had because of the need for social distancing and limiting the number of passengers per bus. Um, we had to put out a bid to, per, to procure supplemental operations. And so we received a bid. Um, we actually received two bids, but um, the stronger bid came from a local, a local private charter service company um, called Young Transportation. And so they started working with um, RATP Dev and the city on June 1st. So it's been about three weeks. And um, we have a contract with them that is supposed to go through December. Hope, I'm hoping we don't, I'm hoping that we don't need it through December, but because, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen and how long this is going to be necessary. We wanted to at least have a contract for six months. And so the, the contract is for 962,000, which is a big number. Um, and that includes four drivers and four buses, seven days a week. Um, and that's what we have right now, but it's very likely that, um, particularly if we can and continue to onboard new drivers with RATP Dev, that we might be able to cut some of those supplemental drivers and that, that service with young. And we may not need all of those buses and drivers on every single day, but um, we've been in a period of needing to train those drivers, make sure that they understand our routes, um, make sure that they understand our, our customer service standards, et cetera. And so we've been working with them and they've been providing us um, uh, ridership information so that we can continue to tweak, uh, continue to tweak where they're going to, where they're going to be most useful and effective. Uh, it's definitely been a learning process for them, for us, and isn't perfect by any means. Um, obviously, we'd love to have more than 10 people on a bus, but we can't. 
And so there have been issues with overcrowding and and then trying to dispatch a, a different vehicle to go pick those folks up um, is what we're trying to hone in on and, and make better because it's definitely been a challenge. Um, we also kind of going back to the to the very the, the difficulty in getting drivers. Um, we hired a company to recruit to try to help us recruit drivers. And so far, we've only gotten one driver from them. They've, they've been having a difficult time finding drivers for us. But we did have one driver start, I believe, last Monday that we got through that company. And, um, and if that person lasts for more than 30 days, we pay that fee. Um, if they don't, we don't pay the fee. But I, you know, I know it sounds kind of weird to to pay to recruit, but it's something that is is becoming necessary because the market for drivers is so so tight, and um, and we've had a lot of folks at RATC Dev um, retire, move to a different state. Um, and so it's like every time we hire somebody, we lose somebody um, for various reasons. So our numbers have been staying somewhat flat, but we do have, I think, three drivers in training right now. So I'm hoping that we can get those, those staffing levels up soon. Um, and then that last line is what we have paid using the CARES Act funds um, for those hours that have been cut, that's so it's basically been about forty thousand dollars a month so far, um, paying the 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 salaries and, and benefits of for those cut service hours. So so far we've spent uh, spent or encumbered about one point five million dollars. And again, we might not use all of that money for the barrier doors, and we might not use all of the money for the young transportation services, but we have it um, encumbered so that it's there in case we need to continue those things. Next slide, please. Any questions? Yeah. Can I ask my question now? Okay. Um, I guess I have three questions about this, and I'll just throw them all out there and get answered. So one would be, what's the estimated time that the barrier doors, the clear doors are, are going in? Second would be the young transportation contract. So we know right now that the four young buses are actually following uh, the WE1, the S3, the S5, and the WE2 on the westbound route. Um, and there's been reports that they've seen buses following buses completely empty or mostly empty. So instead of running additional routes or picking up the run 70 that supposedly couldn't run, so we thought the young bus was going to run the run 70. They're, they're kind of following behind. So I want some clarification about how often it doesn't seem very efficient to have a bus falling behind a bus if you have, unless you have consistent overflow. So I want to get a sense on is someone tracking that? Has there been consistent overflow? Has that been rethought of the fact that we're pairing buses and that's what we're doing with the four additional buses? And then third, of course, I'll just put it on the table here because you're talking about the, the funding um, for hazard pay. Um, we have 93 art staff last check, 80, 80 of them are front facing to the public. Um, I guess at some point, can we talk about the possibilities for bonuses, hazard pay, or anything that is allowed by the CARES Act funding to compensate um, our drivers and our other frontline workers that have been out there since the beginning of the, the pandemic, busting it and front facing with the public and, and doing a, a wonderful job um, for the past, I guess it's been almost three months now, wow, um, that this has been going on. So I just wanna put those three things on the table. Sure. So um, your first question was about the barrier doors. We think we'll have all of them installed by October at the latest. And I know that is a long time from now. Um, much of the delay is related to the to Gillig and the other bus builders, if you will, being closed down. So Gillig in particular is where we get where we're sourcing these from and they are out in California 
they were closed down for I think three months. So um, they're they just I think a couple weeks ago reopened production. So um, that is part of why it's taking so long. In the interim, we have a very um, rudimentary attempt at providing some additional protection, which we are literally using shower curtains in the buses and um, and you know I'm ho- and and also we have you know no fares, so there's there's really not anybody going in and out of the front door, um, except for folks that need to. So um, that's the timeline for that at this point, Um, but hopefully it'll be faster. And and we also have to get, um, so we have three types of buses, right? We've got the the Gillig's, we've got the Proteras, and we've got the vicinities that we've ordered. And so we're working with those three different companies to get those doors all three of those companies were shut down for about three months. Um, so that's why it's taking so long. Um, your second question. So, so we are tracking it. Um, part of what you saw with buses following buses was training because right now we have enough drivers just enough drivers so that our normal RATP dev staff can drive all the routes. However, we were on such a line, such a tipping point that we wanted to train young drivers to drive to drive the routes in case we needed them to pick up an actual route. So there were instances and there there might still be instances where an empty bus is following a route to, to learn that route. Um, so the routes that we cut initially, they weren't necessarily cut only because they had lower ridership. They were also cut, like we tried to look at both ridership and also routes where there was some overlap. So for example, a, a big reason why the 170 was cut not because it necessarily has the lowest ridership, but it has a lower ridership than some routes. Um, It also goes out to Black Mountain. Um, It's a longer route. And and it also has the um, the WE1. um, And it has, you know, some overlap. So we were trying to do a balance of ridership and trying to maintain service on key corridors. So, um, you know, I think we're obviously going to tweak all of this as we go, but the intention is for those, those for the young drivers, young buses to be picking up overcrowding and to focusing on, to focus on overcrowding. And so, um, we, we're going to get weekly ridership reports from them and we have weekly meetings with, with, uh, our ATC guys. That we can ensure that we're using those those buses effectively, and and like I said, it might be that we don't need all of them, um, or we don't need all of them seven days a week. Um, but it's definitely a, it's definitely not as efficient as it as it ultimately will be. I've got one. I've got one. Um, so, this, was there an RFP that was put out for the the barriers locally, or it just seems um, like a huge number for? I mean, how many buses do were needing the the barriers? Twenty seven thousand. I mean, 20, <laughs> okay. So let's just do some simple math. So five hundred thousand divided by twenty seven. That's eighteen thousand per per bus. Yeah. Um, that's so I guess I'm wondering, like, number one, how do we come up with that number? And then two, what the RFP process look like? Because I know we have like Tillerson Glass and that's here in town. Were they were they contacted? Does anybody ask them if they wanted to do it for half? And they'd still be making a lot of money. I'm just I'm curious. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing. We wanted we Gillig had these doors. They're already designed to fit a Gillig bus with 
you know, it's got to fit around the driver's seat. It's got to fit in between the fare box. It's got to be uh, movable. It has to mirror the shape of the windshield. I mean, there's there's tons of things that you know go into it. It's not it's not as simple as putting up a sheet of plexiglass in front of a cash register. No, um, I, I I understand that. That's just that's just that seems like an exorbitant amount of money for 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 a, a box, effectively. So I'm I'm just I'd like some some clarification as to what that process looked like because that's. So we got oh yeah we got some oversight there. We got um we got quotes, and so there's three different buses, right? Three different types of buses, um, and we got quotes from different vendors, and we we had to pull for Gillig ones and the Proterra ones. and that's essentially because they have a design already in hand that fits fits their bus that has been engineered and designed and can be installed um you know relatively readily so well october i mean you said right. it was october potentially that's 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 not readily available that's that's a lot that's a lot of money to wait until october and i can tell you that i i would go out tomorrow and build <laughs> Build a box around these these bus drivers, it, it, and it'd be better than waiting until October. So it just it seems like we're getting screwed on both ends, both well, price and and the timing. And sorry for being brash on that, but that's that as a just a citizen of Asheville, that kind of bugs me. And I I don't I don't blame you. It's frustrating. I mean, but we looked at lots of alternatives. We also talked to. I mean, we talked to tons of different vendors about plexiglass inserts, um, but it's not—it's just—it's not as simple as it sounds. And we—we we don't even have a majority of drivers that want them. Um, but we ultimately made the decision that we thought that it was important to have, and we wanted to make sure that we got something that was going to be safe, um, that can, they wouldn't block any of their visibility. Um, for any of their mirrors, and so it's it's a lot more complicated than it sounds. But I understand the frustration, and I I can assure you that I mean, despite the the, the seeming mistrust that that we always face, that we we did our best to try to find as quickly and as cheap, you know, as inexpensively and. Um, that what we could that would fit all these various buses and that would be then be able to be installed. That's all. That's all I can say. Yeah, and, and I don't want to. I don't want to come off as confrontational I, again. I just I, I want to understand um, because I know there's other people out there that don't have access to 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 you guys like we do. So I, I want to ask on their behalf because when they hear it, I mean me is that when I hear it, I think it's I need I need more information. Um, but um, Kim, did you did you have something? I do. And first, I'm getting um, messages that there are people wanting to comment from the public that don't still have clear information. So um, after this presentation, can we give a reminder on this audio meeting on how people can call in so they don't have to be searching around in, on pages on the Asheville City website? Okay, so um, first I want to say thank you for this presentation. Our transit system is so important and your role, Jessica and City Hall, your staff are so critical to so many people and families in Asheville. These issues of funding and policy show the importance of the transit committee input, which is free volunteer focus group with massive experience that we are not fully utilizing. So we really need to get the transit committee back and working with you. Um, Okay, so revenue loss earlier I noticed was mentioned as fare free and it came up again, but we also have to think about the safety restrictions and the, that we have fewer riders on the bus. Um, so it can't just be that we're losing revenue because of fare free, um, especially when we're potentially double paying for a lot of our services. So um, I'm curious as to why the transit master plan update is still on the remaining funds list. The community most impacted worked with staff and the consultant the city contracted with the transit master plan is all of our plan. It's the cities, the riders, multiple stakeholders. Within two years, we're already looking for a reason to say the plan won't work. When the hardest point of the plan was done with the right route reconfiguration, so um, 
Next, it gets easier with more opportunity to collaborate. Um, I'm not hearing a stated community priority to update the transit master plan, but we do hear a stated community mandate to finish implementing the first year. So I wanna know um, if we can prioritize the first year getting done before we can prioritize overhauling the transit master plan. Um, yeah, I haven't gotten to that part yet, but yeah, we can talk about, we can talk about possible uses for remaining funds. Um, I want to talk about real quick, the HP, uh, HP 77, and then we can, we can talk about possible remaining funds. Okay. okay. Other, sure. And a couple other things. Um, I mm -hmm. see that we're running high on on-time performance, which makes sense with having less traffic on the roads. I know that there were um, agreements in our contract that the riders would get bonuses when we have better on-time performances. So are our drivers receiving those benefits? If there's a, um, an on-time performance bonus paid, then, then I believe that, I believe that RETP Dev provides half of that to drivers. I'm not quite sure exactly what their agreement is. Um, okay, so that just I for me is like part of the contract um, accountability that the city will have to do when we're paying by hour. So we've heard that the CARES Act funds were used to pay the management company for the 170 and the S6 that while they weren't running. So what this group would need is a breakdown of how many drivers were out for COVID related reasons and for how long what was the impact on their paid time off? Um, so I see that I'm hearing that we are, the drivers are now having to use paid time off, but it looks like we still have a $40,000 line item in June. So it looks like we're paying RapiDev, but we're not getting that benefit to our staff. Um, I'm not aware that that's the case. So I was, I've been told that all of the CARES Act money that's going towards those Miss service hours is credited to anybody, any driver that hasn't um, had full hours because of because of those cuts. So that money is specifically for those salaries and benefits of any any driver or a, any other staff that might um, might have been furloughed or might not have the hours that they normally would. Um, so I don't think that's the case. Um, I haven't heard anybody say that that's not the case. Okay. I just want to make sure that while we're spending almost a million dollars with the Young's contract, that we're actually not perpetuating a situation where our management company has now no pressure to actually take care of our staff. I, I don't believe we are. Um, okay, I'm going to move on if that's okay. So um, we are estimating, so this slide is, is really talking about June, um, which we're already mostly through, but it's to, to try to say like, okay, here's, here's what we think by the end of this fiscal year. Um, in a week, we will have spent a CARES Act funds. Um, so for um, for June, we estimate that we'll have spent about six thousand dollars more on supplies and equipment. Um, that includes again cleaning supplies, PPE, things of that nature. Um, we also have, uh, as Kim mentioned, we've had fare losses. So when we suspended fare payment back in March. Uh, we get about $210,000 in fares. And that's not just from, um, that's not just from the fixed route service. That's also from paratransit. So, um, so we've got, we've got $210,000 in offset fare revenue that we expect to need to dip into CARES Act money for. Um, another thing that we expect to, to, um, I'm sorry, it's not $210,000 a month. It's $210,000 is the total fare loss that we expect for the whole time um, that we've not been collecting fares from March to June 30th. And then the same 
same for the offset of parking revenue. So parking revenue contributes about a million and a half dollars a year to the transit fund. And so $280,000 is what we expect to not have from the parking revenue um, between when we stop charging parking fees and the end of June. And then there's been a little bit of city staff overtime incurred in dealing with, with everything extra. Um, not a very significant number, but that's something that we do have the option to charge back to the CARES Act rather than the general fund. Um, so adding all of that up, what we've spent so far, what we expect to spend by the end of this month is um, a little over $2 million, which is a significant chunk of what we received. So um, I didn't get a chance to update this, this presentation um, from last Friday, but at that point in time, it looked like we would have about one and a half million dollars extra. Um, but if you could go to the next slide, Amy. Um, so unfortunately, our state legislature passed a bill yesterday that is taking away in this coming fiscal year um, our funding that we get through the SMAP program, which is a maintenance assistance program. And we get about $1 million annually, I think it might actually be 1.1 million from the state. And that funding goes towards our operations. So the state passed this bill yesterday as part of their effort to reduce their expenses. And they made lots of cuts across the state, but they zeroed out the SNAP budget for the year and they zeroed out the equivalent uh, for the rural transit agencies. So this is a, a significant loss for us and um, and is very likely going to need to be offset by, by the CARES Act funds. And the reasoning that the legislature legislators gave for this cut was that everybody got CARES Act funds, so they should be able to handle this cut. <clears throat> so unfortunately, uh, we're, we're likely going to have to tap into CARES money to offset that. Um, and, you know, I said it happened very quickly. Um, I heard about it late last week, and I tried to get the word out. Um, our legislative liaison talked to legislators to try to convince them not to vote for this. And uh, the North Carolina Public Transit Association lobbied very hard. And ultimately, it was supported by both sides, <laughs> bipartisan support and um, is going to the governor's desk. And if it hasn't already been signed, is, is going to be signed. So, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is cracking. So um, the, the number on the previous slide would actually be less if we do indeed have to use the CARES Act money to offset that loss, which is extremely frustrating because it's not what the intent of CARES Act money was for. It was not to plant other funding, it was to deal with COVID impacts, which we're still dealing with and we probably will be dealing with for a long time. So, um, you know, my my hope was that with whatever we had remaining, we would, we would keep a good chunk of it to make sure that we get through the pandemic because I, at this point, I don't see an end in sight to our need for the 10 person limit on the buses. Um, and I don't really see an end in sight for our stopping levels at this point either. So um, I really wanted to make sure that we kept kept a significant amount um, to ride us through this, this crisis. Um, does anybody have any questions about the, the bill, HB 77? 
Do we know if our local representatives, at, well, our, our state representatives have voted for this? I, I haven't had a chance to look at the roll call on that, but to, what do they do? I, you know, I don't know. Um, I could go back and try to find out, but I think it passed overwhelmingly. Shame on them. On What's that? Shame on them. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very unfortunate because, I mean, it's not just us, right? Like, we're not the only ones that are, are, are so I think everybody's local representative voted for it, essentially. Um, and it's, it's not, it's not, not great. Um, well, I, I asked that, I, I asked that so I know who, you know, yeah, who to, to go and call and chastise after the fact. And, I, you know. I'll send out I'll send out a link to the roll call vote list. Thank you. Um, and then my last slide, which again I did before the bill was signed. Um, again, you know, I was hoping that we could save some of it to make sure that we get through this this issue, you know, this time that we're in. Um, but there's been uh, lots of other ideas for how we might be able to spend the, the funding and you know hazard pay has been something that's been mentioned multiple times um and that's something that would have to you know whatever remaining funds there are and how they're spent ultimately would have to be um a decision by the city council and so you know again there's not really any restrictions on it it's used for operations it could be used for capital so you could use it for um, building more bus shelters, buying another bus, um, expanding service, expand, expanding the operations, um, hours of operation. There's not really any limit other than um, you. we just want to make sure that we get through the time before we spend it. And, um, and, and, you know, in general, I would never recommend spending one-time money on continual operations, but it's an, it's an option. Um, so, so there, again, there's lots of different opportunities for the funding to be spent. And then um, just real quick, there could be more money coming. You know, there could be another bill or, or there could be another stimulus package. Um, there, there was one that is working, um, through the house transportation committee, um, for infrastructure from transit rail and all those things. But from what I've been reading, it doesn't look like it's going to get passed by the Senate. So we're keeping an eye on all of this stuff, obviously, and, and hoping that we get some more support. Beth has her hand up. Yeah, I just want to bring up again um, the possibility for doing some kind of bonuses or hazard pay for our, our drivers and our front-facing staff. There's not. I, I know that there's some language in there that makes it difficult, but with anything, is there a way to do a workaround or end around or something? I know morale. From what we hear, morale is really low right now. Um, it's very stressful um, what these folks are doing out there every day um, during this pandemic, uh, working with the public, driving the buses. I just want to make sure that we don't forget. And then Kim mentioned about the bonuses, you know, that's supposed to be built in also. So why aren't these things, I think, getting passed along and really impact those folks that are out there doing the, the work every day? I just want to make sure that we don't forget that. I also had a question that um, just to confirm the Young's contract is in, is it in its entirety in fiscal year 20 when the majority of the service would be in the next fiscal year? No, it's, um, it's, it's um, the contract is encumbered. So it's like the money is in a, it's there in, in it's been separated so that it can't be spent um, on something else. So it doesn't really matter which fiscal year it's in. Um, it's, it's already been set aside for that contract, even though, uh, you know, it's straddling fiscal years. 
And then um, following the budget work sessions with the county, has there been an update on um, the county and paratransit since they also have CARES Act funding? Mm -hmm. Um, well, okay, let me see if I can answer your question. So yes, they did receive CARES Act funding, um, but we're the ones that pay for paratransit. And we, we did have, we have had less expenses for paratransit. So originally the county estimated that by in fiscal year 20, this current fiscal year that we would spend about one point, I think it was like 1.1 million or a little bit over 1 million. And that came, that is coming in um, le much less. And um, so we have, we've had, you know, expense savings, but we also had some revenue loss, um, but it did help that bottom line. So if you remember, like in January or so, we were thinking that we were going to be short about $500,000 in the transit fund. We're not short anymore because our fuel expenses went down and our paratransit expenses went down. So we weren't going to have um, a shortage in our fund for transit that we thought we were going to have in January, February. Um, so that's that essentially got zeroed out because of COVID. Right. And also sense? just to follow up on that, it does seem like it would be appropriate in the next few months if, since we have a special agreement with the county to collaborate during these times um, with both staff and resources, if there was a way for something like the 170 to be covered with the county in the future so that we could wrap up the Young's contract early for a cost saving, it seems wise. So the county was the first the first people that we talked to um, about providing supplemental service and using the paratransit vehicles and the drivers and such. And, and I mean, that was obviously like the first, the first people we called and, and they have the same problem we do, which is they don't have enough drivers. They could only fit two people on a vehicle. And so they were having to run multiple vehicles to make the same trip. So, I mean, their problem is essentially exactly the same one that we have. So they couldn't, they couldn't help us at all because they were in the same spot as we were. Um, but yeah, we had multiple conversations with them because it seemed like a great idea, but it was the exact same problem we had. Their buses are smaller. They could only put two people on them. They were having to run multiple buses and drivers to do the same route. So it really wasn't, it wasn't a solution. And, you know, uh, the, hazard, the hazard pay, it's not, um, it's not my decision. If the city council is interested and in provide some kind of incentive, then that would that would ultimately be their decision. Um, it's an allocation of, of money. It would have to be a amendment to the contract with the Dev. Those are not those are not impossible things, but it would need to be a discussion on whether or not that was an expenditure that they wanted to make using CARES Act funds. It's, I mean, if you guys want to make a motion or of some sort to that effect, then then, then we can talk with, um, then we can, you know, move that forward. I make a motion to lift up advice to the city council that um, the contract re renegotiation be considered for hazard pay for our frontline workers for retention of staff and to ensure um, service. A second that motion. Okay, so we have a, uh, a motion from Kim Roney um, and a second from Elizabeth Medlock um, to, one more time, can we get that a little bit more concise? Yeah, I was just typing it up. Um, motion to advise council to renegotiate the contract for hazard pay to ensure staffing levels and service for transit. Okay, I'll try. So uh, the motion- Sorry, frontline workers needs to be in there. Uh, the motion is to re-examine the 
the contract uh, uh, as regards to hazard pay for our frontline workers, uh, particularly our bus drivers. Uh, we've got, um, that's the motion as I understand it. Is that correct, Kim? I would like to include to ensure staffing levels and continued service. We don't know what's gonna happen this fall. We need okay. to maintain our service levels. Okay, so the motion uh, in addition would be to in, to keep staffing at current levels. Um, uh, so we've got a, a motion, a second by Elizabeth. Um, all in favor, we'll do a roll call vote on this. Um, so we'll go down the line. I, I think just, just to clarify, we didn't want to say to maintain current staffing levels, right? Or we said we want to give them incentives to maintain their employment with us. Is that what we're doing? I guess my, my suggestion would be if we're hearing the, the only way we're going to get hazard pay for our frontline workers is if council has the will to renegotiate the contract. And what I'm hearing from staff is that we would need to advise council in that regard. Then my motion is to suggest to council to ensure hazard pay by renegotiating the contract as part of hazard pay for frontline workers to ensure staffing so we can ensure service. It's three things, but it's all wrapped up in hazard pay to make sure the bus doesn't stop running. Okay, I'm trying to write this down. I welcome amendments. Feel free to type that up in the uh, in the sidebar too. If anybody's got a, a motion, that makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then I can I can read directly from from that. Sorry for the for the delay, folks. We're, it's all new with our new digital technology. Okay, um, so I've got a motion from Kim Roney uh, to renegotiate the contract to negotiate hazard pay for frontline workers to ensure staffing levels and to ensure continued service. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay, we've got a, a motion and a second. Do we have any comment? No, okay. So I'm gonna pull this up for a roll call vote um, and we'll go down the line. Yes, yes. Just, um, you may wanna clarify that it's surrounding the COVID-19 issue. Okay. Rather than just generically renegotiating that, you know, it's it's around this COVID-19 crisis. Okay, um, so that's, that's noted um, that the motion is uh, pertaining to um, the consequences of COVID-19. Um, so any comment? Okay, um, we're gonna call this up for a roll call. Um, we'll start with, um, Using a list that may uh, make sure I don't miss anybody. Uh, Vice Chair Medlock? Heck yes. Strong yes. Very, very good. Uh, Commissioner Roney? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Warren? Yes. Vote yes. Okay. Commissioner Armstrong? Yes. Commissioner Lee? Yes. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Winsel. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Katz. Yes. Okay. Um, so that's uh, uh, the yeas have it uh, of our voting members. Um, Commissioner Sexton and Archibald, would you like to just for 
just for the sake, uh, would you like to say yay or nay? Yes. Very good. Yes. Thank you. All right, so it's passed um, the motion to renegotiate the contract and negotiate a hazard pay for frontline workers to ensure staffing levels and ensure continued service uh, pertaining to oh, to renegotiate contract RPD dev to negotiate hazard paid frontline workers to ensure staffing levels to ensure continued service as a response to COVID-19. Okay, very good. Um, now, Jessica, uh, was there anything left in your presentation? No, I think that's it for, for that, unless there's any other questions that you guys have about CARES Act stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, if not, I don't see any hands going up, uh, then we're gonna move on. Uh, and I'm really excited about this one. I know a lot of you folks are too. Um, this update is gonna be regarding um, shared streets, public space implementation, safe commerce zones. And it uh, looks like Jessica, Dana Frankel and Stephanie Dahl will be presenting for us. So take it away. Hey guys, thank you. Um, thanks chair and commissioners for allowing us to provide you some updates today on these exciting initiatives. I'm Dana Frankel and I work in the planning department and I'm in the strategic design and development office. So Steph and Jessica are gonna be available as well as myself for questions at the end of this presentation. Um, and Jessica is gonna chime in on, on at least one slide, but I'm happy to provide you all with updates on this work. So if we um, just an overview of the presentation, we're gonna talk about the purpose of these initiatives. We're gonna talk about the guiding principles and goals that are, um, that are guiding this work. The team, the city team that's working on this. Um, we'll also talk through our timeline and we'll get into some of the details of the programs as well as the application and review process. And we'll talk about the shared streets, which we've just recently launched and, um, and what we're looking at ahead for that, as well as other initiatives down the line. So the purpose of these initiatives, it is dealing with using public spaces differently, but it's also dealing with allowing for more flexible use of private properties. And what we wanna do is to be able to facilitate safer distancing measures and specifically support economic recovery and allow businesses to expand into both public and private spaces in order to open or continue to operate safely. So this work is very much aligned with um, public health guidance that, as we know, is, you know, evolving and changing, but the goal is to be able to support the community and, and being able to distance and be safe and support our business community. And just to expand on that a bit, so we've laid out some guiding principles and goals. These are also available on the project page on the website, so some of you might have um, seen these already, but I'll just highlight, I'll highlight a, a few. Um, aligning with public health guidelines, supporting recovery of our, of our local economy, and again, providing safe customer access to goods and services. We want to be flexible generally in this work to be able to, um, to adapt to the critical needs of our community and of our economy. And we, um, we're approaching this work um, it, as um, inclusively as possible. And I would say, you know, approaching engagement in an equitable way. And part of what that means is we're working very directly with those who are being impacted. So in some of these areas where we're looking at these programs and also working to better understand um, those in the most need uh, that are facing challenges related to COVID-19. And we definitely, you know, this is a, these programs, um, it's a way to test ideas. And these, a lot of these ideas aren't new. It's the type of thing that you all know a lot about and making places more pedestrian oriented and you know, um, slowing vehicles down and, and making places safer for people. It's a great opportunity for us to learn what's working specific to COVID-19, but also learn more about what works well in our community um, and be able to consider what 
um, what could be implemented long term. So that's definitely something that we want to do throughout um, this time. And now I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but we're committed to doing this work through the fall. So through October 31st. And things could change and adjust between now and then, but we want to commit to, to trying these initiatives for at least that period of time. And we, yeah, we are working to have an equity lens in terms of how um, businesses are being prioritized or how applications are being processed, um, want to be as responsive as, po as possible, and we want to, um, to be able to adapt as we go without compromising public safety. So public health and safety is, is the you know, critical underlying foundation of this work. I think we can advance to the team. And I, I think really what I want to share here, we have a core team of city staff that are working on this, um, but we pretty much have every department involved. So there's a range of initiatives that, that, we've, that we've rolled out and that we're working towards. And as I'm sure you can understand, that touches a lot of different departments and a lot of different staff people. Um, so we're working as quickly as we can, but also being as thorough as possible um, to make sure that we're understanding any health and safety considerations and engaging with um, city staff as needed to, to make good decisions. We also are working with traffic planning and design. They're helping with some of the um, details of the traffic planning and the signage plan. The Asheville Design Center is helping with some of the signage for the shared streets, kind of the more fun signage and also helping um, a bit with community engagement. And then we're also talking with Asheville on Bikes and other nonprofits about how to partner with them. That means potentially um, borrowing materials. Asheville on Bikes has extra planters from the Street Tweaks project. So being able to leverage those types of resources in our community as well. So the initiatives that, that are um, rolling at this point, we have... Um, we, we've eased some regulations that we previously had in place during COVID-19. So that includes easing of restrictions for food trucks. We've also provided some more flexibility for businesses to put out signage, say they're doing um, you know, curbside pickup services. They can add an extra sign to their business that, that promotes that type of service and ability. So we're happy to ease in ways that we can that supports our community and being safe and our businesses and functioning. We launched curbside pickup zones, both in downtown and on Haywood Road uh, towards the end of May. And we've gotten pretty positive feedback about that. And it just enables, again, um, safer, easier customer access to goods and services. And um, we know a lot of our businesses, particularly restaurant businesses, are offering curbside pickup. So we have, I think, about between 25 and 30 zones, and those are shared spaces where um, folks can come, it, they're, mar they're labeled as 10 minutes. So, you know, they can stay for a short period of time, get their goods, maybe run into a store quickly um, to pick up what they need, a pharmacy or other types of services and um, move on. We also have um, provided flexibility for how businesses and organizations use private spaces. And that also, that program was launched on May 22nd. And what that with that, what we've seen that mean to this point is businesses using service, service parking lots and other available space around their place of business differently. So we've seen a lot of folks do expanded outdoor dining in, um, in some of their underutilized spaces. So we're seeing this, this more so probably applies on other types of commercial quarters than it would in a denser downtown environment. Um, but we've seen it um, in multiple parts of town. And I have a couple photos that I'll show just a bit later. We also just launched at the beginning of June, some more flexibility for how businesses and organizations can use public sidewalk space. Now we do want to make sure that six feet of pedestrian space is still maintained, but in many of our downtown sidewalks, they're 10 or 12 feet and businesses are able to put a few two top tables against their business or put some tables along the curb. And, um, and we've seen a lot of businesses go through that process and utilize that. Um, you may be aware the city did implement some full street closures, pedestrian only areas during some of the protests in early June. Um, that's not continuing at this point. Um, and shared streets. So, and this is along the lines of some of the ideas we heard from some of you all, 
where we're providing pedestrian priority zones in, um, you know, on a block or on a corridor where vehicles must yield to those pedestrians, in some cases changing a two-way street to a one-way street, and then also providing um, spaces for businesses and organizations to have programming, outdoor dining, um, retail display and sales, and, and flexible uses in that way. And we'll talk just a little bit more about that too. And we also, so that was launched just on Friday in the first district where we um, installed that is on the block. So on portions of Eagle and South Market Streets downtown. Um, and also last Friday, we opened up our parklet program. So that's available to any business or organization that has on-street parking um, adjacent, public on-street parking adjacent to their building or to, to their business. So we have an application process for that. Um, it allows them to use one to three spaces, and there are design parameters that we've provided in guidelines, and I'll talk just a little bit more about that process as well, but we can advance to the next slide. So all of these programs are being, um, the intake process is being managed by our development services office, so they already have a great online platform and online application tools, and so we're utilizing that. And, um, and we're, we're trying to make this as simple as possible. So for programs such as flexible use of private properties and use of the sidewalk, um, if there's enough space, we're asking folks to submit a diagram, but if they follow the guidelines that we're providing, they're going to be approved. Um, and we're looking at a one day turnaround time for that. So I know that's been very much appreciated by folks that are um, using these programs. For the parklet program, that's going to take us a little bit more time because we have interdepartmental review teams. We did just open that up on Friday. And we know there's interest from several different businesses, um, specifically downtown and on Haywood Road. And we're working on processing a first batch of applications. We're, we're aiming for a one week turnaround time. It would be longer than that if we're looking if um, at having platforms built, if that's something that the applicant would do, then there's a little bit more review involved in that to ensure safety. Um, and we are working to prioritize BIPOC, um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color owned and managed businesses in this application process and to be able to provide additional one-on-one -on -one assistance, whether that's on design details or, um, you know, ordering supplies or other needs that they have. I uh, just wanted to show a couple really good examples of use of private property. So the one on the left is Bramari Brewing. They took part of their um, parking lot and they added some wood chips, created a nice seating area. They still have some parking remaining, but I would guess they have probably about at least 12 additional tables here, um, totally in line with the guidelines. And Zia Taqueria, I haven't seen this in person, but I saw them post a picture this week. So they've used some of their surface parking to, um, to put additional seating. And they've, it's, it looks like they've spaced it really well. And that's part of the requirements as well. Obviously, we want people to be able to be six feet apart and for the seating to be spaced adequately. So those are two great examples. And the shared streets program to get into a little bit more detail. So we've, we've talked with several of you, we've heard from so many folks in the community, um, different ideas for how streets can be, um, can support our community during COVID-19 and pedestrian only streets, you know, it's not a new idea. Um, it's something that, that has a lot of benefits, you know, in a lot of other cities that we see. So we really wanna use the lens of COVID-19 to think about our streets differently and to be able to move quickly since there, a lot of our business community, I mean, every day really matters, um, but, but we really are <clears throat> aiming as much as we possibly can to be able to support the specific needs during this time for distancing and safety during COVID-19. So we, we have read a ton of ideas. We got really great concept plans, um, which some of you were involved in and took a deep look at those. Um, and we also asked for some help from traffic planning and design to take a really hard look at those and to be able to help us consider what's feasible and um, what traffic safety um, aspects would need to be in place to move some of those ideas forward. 
Um, we So in our approach to shared streets, and I think it is similar to a lot of the ideas, we're not at this point doing full street closures, but we're creating pedestrian priority spaces. So emergency vehicles, um, sanitation pickup, ADA parking spaces, loading deliveries, those activities could continue on the shared streets, but they should be clearly marked that this is a pedestrian priority area. And in addition to that designation, we're actually creating designated spaces that can be used very much flexibly for pedestrian only activities, including seating or um, various public access needs um, or merchandise and things like that. And, and I should say, so our shared streets, I think each street is a little bit different and offers different opportunities that, that has various benefits in our community. Um, some of that is more focused on supporting the specific businesses on a corridor. Others is more about community building, which I'd say is part of the opportunity in the Eagle Market District. Some of that focuses on multimodal transportation. So one of the streets that we're going to be um, making changes to is College Street to add a bike lane there. And so I think there's multiple benefits to gain from this and, and hopefully it's helpful to try these different um, these different ways to test um, the, the, the community's um, the community's needs and um, and to be able to learn what what's helpful and what's not. So we are also working on securing a budget for materials um, that's kind of in progress still. And if we could advance to the next slide. So I mentioned our first shared street implementation is on a portion of Eagle and South Market Street. So the larger photo is of Eagle between, or is of South Market between Eagle and Sycamore. And you can kind of see the community decided on what colors the cones should be painted and you can kind of see how those um, areas where the on-street parking would have been are designated for more flexible um, pedestrian uses. And then the smaller photo is on Eagle Street and you'll see that Limones was able to expand outdoor dining into the street. So our, within our first batch of shared streets, this was the first area on Eagle and Market and tomorrow we're working to launch um, the next shared streets on Banks Buxton, um, the portion of Collier between Banks and Buxton, as well as on Church Street. Um, the following week, we're looking at implementation on Wall Street and a portion of College Street, just the portion of College Street between um, Haywood and Patton. And I would like to turn it over to Jessica to talk about that next batch of shared streets that we're looking at. Thanks, Dana. So the second batch is our, our streets that we're still we're still kind of uh, conceptualizing what might happen. Um, we are planning to add bike lanes to both College Street and Patton, so it would basically be uh, uh, you know since those streets are one-way streets, we'd have a bike lane in the westbound direction on College and a bike lane in the eastbound direction on Patton. Um, this is something that we've been really interested in doing for quite some time and um, had really been thinking a lot about before COVID-19. Um, and I think that this is, a, is like the perfect opportunity to, to just to do it. Um, not only because we've got lower traffic volumes, but it's it's just it's just a this you know as unfortunate as this pandemic has been, it has given us a lot more opportunity to just do things that we um, we've been wanting to do but haven't done. And so um, we are securing the materials for that right now and um, hope to be able to install this in the coming weeks. The second batch I don't have, a, have an exact timeline on, but I would, I would say that it'll probably um, happen in July, at least as far as the bike lanes on College and Patton go. Um, and then the other, the other ones that we've listed here, some of those were, you know, all of these were part of the concept plans that 
that the multimodal and AOB shared with us. And, um, and we're looking at all of those streets. We've had um, some conversations about Lexington. And um, I think some of the business owners there had expressed potential, maybe not a full closure, but maybe some kind of like weekend closure um, that, you know, like a, an open, open street kind of event um, that we might pursue with them on a weekend. But that's not to say that when we meet directly with those businesses that there might be a different idea that comes out of it. Um, we've also been looking at Battery Park and Page, possibly one weighing them to give some additional space to adjacent property owners and then um, Walnut as well. So, you know, as soon as we um, get through tomorrow's installation, we're going to start to dive in on the details of, of this second batch um, more thoroughly in the next in the next week or two. Thanks, Jessica. I can hop back in. Um, in addition to looking at the next round of shared streets, we're looking at other opportunities to support our business community and specifically to support um, our Black and BIPOC uh, businesses through more flexible use of, of public properties. And that could mean vending opportunities or um, other things like that. I know now, um, and the governor just while during this meeting extended phase two for three more weeks. And so we're not doing special events at this time. So we need to watch that guidance really closely, but we're definitely um, thinking about and working on with various staff members, including our business inclusion office. Um, opportunities that um, can support our community. Um, and looking at, so some of this work does focus on downtown and a lot of it focuses on commercial areas, but we want to be able to look at ways to support the community um, in other areas as well, including residential areas. And I know that we've heard um, some recommendations and ideas on that. And we have to be flexible to make adjustments. Um, so for example, one reason that we have the designated spaces along the commercial corridors um, and not just a shared area where people can have seating is because if there is alcohol served at the state level, ABC requires that those spaces are designated. And we didn't know that until after phase two was launched. So, you know, again, we, we really wanna work to be um, in alignment fully with the public health guidance. Um, and, and I, yeah, I want to point out that each program in each location is very unique. Um, we're working really closely with business and neighborhood organizations when they are in place. So we worked with the Block Community Collaborative to roll out the initiative on South Market and Eagle. Um, we're working with the South Slope Neighborhood Association to roll out this next phase. We're in touch with the Wall Street business owners um, and we, we want to make sure we're doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one communication to understand um, what their specific needs are and, and what the impacts will be. And we hope the impacts will largely be positive. We are going to be launching wider opportunities for public input. Um, and we, we do have great general ideas now that these programs are all launched as of just Friday. We want to get um, specific feedback on each of them and see what needs to change. We have right now, we have just a few questions up about the curbside pickup program. So people can give us feedback on that, but we'll be expanding um, those questions to the larger public soon. And, and we'll specifically ask if, if it is a customer or someone in the general public, or if it's an employee at a business, a, a business owner, we want, want to understand how people are using these programs. Um, and with that, I'm available, Stephanie Dahl is available, and Jessica's available, and we'd love to be able to answer any questions that you have. And I want to make sure that you're aware of the project page that has more information. Um, that short link has changed a couple of times, but it's the same page. It's at ashevillenc.gov slash AVL shares space. Thank you so much. Um, this is Kim talking. I just wanted to say I'm grateful to see Eagle Market Street prioritize as one of our historic black business neighborhoods in a way that supports businesses owned by people of color in our community. 
Um, I really appreciate the quick response to making our streets safer and more useful to our community. It's definitely on the list of things that we need to take with us beyond the pandemic for a more resilient community. And I know a lot of the people in this meeting today um, have been helping with that. Um, are there any streets where local businesses are communicating a desire to entirely close a street for all or part of the day? I think that's a good question. I think we're hearing more of that from the general public and not so much from individual business owners. So I think we've heard it from a couple of folks on Wall Street and it's something we've you know, been working with them on and talking with them about for years. Um, in large part, I think when when a lot of our business owners here close streets, they worry about things like delivery needs um, and other uh, drop-offs for older folks or ADA parking and things like that. Um, emergency access is also a really important issue or um, consideration. So when the city, uh, you know, closes streets or allows closed streets, those barricades need to be manned so that if there's an emergency vehicle, um, they can be opened back up. And so not to say that type of concept isn't possible in the future, but it definitely um, requires uh, more resources and more at a different level coordination with the business community. At this point, we really want to be careful to not make things harder for them, but to be able to support them with opening and operating safely. Then the second thing is I'm hearing a lot of questions from restaurant folks, and especially my experience working in the service industry, what happens to a check when you can serve a BEV? So um, are there any ways that the city can either make the transition um, easier for uh, folks dealing with the state regulations or potentially work with other states across the state to make it easier for folks to expand um, the areas where they can serve alcoholic beverages? So it's actually, and I'm I'm assuming that um, the flexibility is carrying with the extension of phase two, but at the gov at the state level, that process was made very easy. So they don't normally, if they expand where they're serving, they have to go back to the state and ask for an expansion of premises. They don't have to do that anymore, and the city isn't asking for any additional steps. So when they are making use of these programs, we're making we're asking them to align with that um, with those state requirements. And right now, there's a lot of the, the states basically put those some of those requirements on hold. So it's actually um, there's not a lot of hold up. There, there's really no steps to make that happen outside of the processes that we already have in place. Thank you. Sure. And I should say that there were advocates to help with that, and the chamber, the local chamber, definitely was um, advocating to make that as easy as possible for businesses. Elizabeth, uh, looks like you've got a question or a comment. Yeah, I think as someone who just lived downtown up until two days ago, um, what's happened is that the streets are actually less accessible and less navigable. Um, than they ever have been since we ceded the, the public space to restaurants. So one of the issues that I know it's been having, and, and I talked to a lot of downtown residents and people trying to navigate downtown, is that there's ADA violations all over the place. There's places, and you know, Michael and some other folks walked around downtown with me, where there's um, things on the sidewalk in front of Chestnut, for example, you can't even hardly get by it. Yeah. Um, there's places where there's two feet, one foot, and it's all over the place. I And I showed you guys, I've been sending you guys pictures of what downtown is like to navigate with all this signage and these things all over the place. We have a lot of people walking in the streets um, I have pictures of people walking in the streets. I probably, I would say, had to walk in between car, park cars and in the street about 80% of the time we're walking downtown. It's one of the reasons we moved up our move. Um, we moved six weeks earlier than we were supposed to because we just could not stay downtown anymore as residents. And so I'm wondering, and, and you know, everybody's heard this from me before and I've emailed everybody, um, from a pedestrian standpoint, Point. And the same thing with Eagle Street. I will say when Eagle Street got done, I walked across the street. Um, we drove it. The signs were tiny. I don't know if they're supposed to be bigger. They were eight and a half by 11 signs. You couldn't see the signs from a car. You couldn't see the sign to slow down. There was no speed limit. 
it in a car you'd have to jog into uh, where there was um, on street parking but the folks that live on Eagle Street hang out there usually on that they used to like there's a lot of people a few people in wheelchairs that would always be around there and it is significantly less safer for them because you have cars like doing this to jog around the people eating outside so I can just tell you as someone that walks the streets again every day and did and talking to downtown residents um we find it less safe and less navigable um so i'm just asking that in general is how to make sure that we come to a place where it truly is a shared street and it truly is some place where we really are protecting health and safety at the same time while helping businesses you know be viable thank you for sharing that feedback um, we do have additional signage coming to Eagle Market, and we're noticing, and, and I did review, you, we took a look at your photos, and in most of those cases, those businesses haven't gone through these processes, and we're following up with them, it, but the feedback is really important. Um, it's something that we need to work to address as we go, and we need to make sure that businesses are following the guidelines and maintaining six feet of passable space, but it is good feedback. Thank you. Um, I've got one. So we already have a pedestrian prioritized zone uh, on Wall Street, but it doesn't really act that way because we still have a lot of on street parking there. It was never removed. So there's still a lot of cars that are going through. Um, what what are we going to do to these new zones to make it not just a, another zone like Wall Street, which in name and principle, it's supposed to be pedestrian prioritized, but it's not. Uh, are we going to be re removing some some parking and just keep the like the like handicapped accessible parking and or what 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 are the specifics on how we enforce the movement of uh, local traffic versus not local traffic? Yeah, and then there is going to be signage that makes that clearer. In Wall Street's case, you know, there's a tiny little sign that says vehicles should yield, um, but also in most cases a lot of the on-street parking is being removed. And again, that's specifically to allow the businesses and organizations to be able to expand into that space. Um, ADA parking will remain. So there's a few spaces on Wall Street now um, and, and loading and deliveries have to continue, but we want to, um, to, to try and not have through traffic. We're gonna try to, um, you know, make it really clear at the entrances to these streets, but, and, and the removal of the, of a good number of the on street parking spaces should make a big difference, but, but help us. I think so too. Yeah. Help us keep an eye on how it's going. Um, shared streets have very few downsides aside from the loss of on street parking, which is a real trade off, but, um, but hopefully this is something that works well in our community. Um, follow up on the, on the parking uh, we'll be removing some parking. Is there any? Has there been any talk or any thoughts of um, incentivizing people to use the decks more? I mean, can we, well, I know that's a source of revenue, but yeah, do we want to reward people for using the decks? I think the reward that we have currently is that the decks are still free, which will okay. continue through July. And on okay. an ongoing basis, the decks are slightly cheaper than on-street parking spaces. And we offer the first hour free if people are in and out of the garage within that hour. So if they're doing a quick errand or picking up food or whatever that is. So we do have some of those in place. Would, would you guys consider doing a voucher program for anybody that goes to one of these zones, you so know, after July? I think that's an interesting idea. Um, it translates into revenue loss and, and, you know, or there's in some cases we have businesses that do pro currently provide vouchers to customers, but I think that's really good feedback to consider. Cool. I do have one other question, but I don't want to hog up the airtime. Um, does anybody else have anything? Okay. Well, my other question uh, is regarding the uh, the circulator route that um, basically the safe bike route that would connect different zones. Um, so that's part A of the question. And part B of the question is um, what are we going to do to expand these zones outside of the downtown quarter? So ideally, we'd like to have these uh, spread across town so there's some equity there. Uh, 
So if they are spread across town, for example, if there were one to pop up in the red or Biltmore Village, what are we going to do to create safe bike routes that would connect all these zones? I think I'm going to ask Jessica to take this one if you could. Um, so I have some of my staff looking right now at the computer concept that was provided to us. And um, and we are looking at doing some of these things outside of downtown. Downtown's obviously been the big focus because it's the probably, I would argue that it's probably the place where the social distancing issues are the greatest. But we are looking at Biltmore Village, um, the RAD, et cetera. Um, and so, I, you know, I said there was a first batch and a second batch, but there's very likely to be additional ones after that. Um, and so I don't have any specific info I can provide on on the status of like the bike bike connection concept, but um, we're looking at that right now. Okay, because and the, obviously the reason I ask is that um, you know there's a lot of new riders that are out there. There are folks that are pulling out their bikes that haven't they haven't pulled them out in month or years. You know, like I'm one of those people. I had to put do tune up on my bike and it's terrible and I it's not in good shape. It's not really even that safe to ride. But I know I'm not the only one. Um, so I'm really hoping for safety's sake and and not just COVID. Um, we'll 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 do do that. And Randy, I think, I think you, you, you can weigh in on that as well. Yeah. Just so one thing we have to consider too, is additional bike parking, because a lot of times we say, well, bikes can park to anything, you know, the, the parking meters or whatever, but in this time where we're trying to share the space in a way that everybody can use it, we need to be careful that maybe a bike that would non normally not take up important sidewalk space by locking it to whatever is available, which is kind of what we have in Asheville. Um, that won't work now because we need to have that space designated for other uses. And so we really should be supplying some other bike parking in these zones. And that could be what we used to call plaza racks, um, which are a safe rack that are, is portable and you can put it into a bike parking space, for example, or a car parking space. And you can fit, you know, I think, I don't know, 14, 16 bikes in that one car space, you know? So I'm not sure if we're considering that type of thing or not, but that really encourages people then to ride their bike. Cause if you ride your bike to these areas, which makes a lot of sense, you don't have to worry about the parking, which we're eliminating some of that anyway, and have no place to park it, then you're less incentivized to go to the zones in the first place and also to use an, a, you know, a mode of transportation that's more appropriate. Randy, I'm curious, you what were your thoughts yeah, on the, yeah. um, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, Randy, I, I was going to ask you what your yeah. thoughts were. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, you go, Jessica. Okay. I'll go. Randy, what were your thoughts on the on the new um, bike uh, rack that was put in on, on Biltmore Avenue? I'm not sure if I've seen it. So I, to look and see. I think it's, it almost is like, uh, I'm assuming from based on what you described, it's very, it seems like what you're describing where they've taken a, a parking spot uh, and then they put, put the, uh, the bike racks in it. Yeah. I, I, I so all of the, I can tell you that was in front of my building. So where the crosswalk was, where, where Eagle Street is, my building was active. That was actually a parking space taken where the crosswalk was because the sight lines were really bad. So they took the, the parking spots there and they put the three back. Parts. Unfortunately, they weren't installed correctly. So they're all loose and they're unbolted. So it's hard to park your bike there now because you can kind of wave them back and forth because they weren't bolted down. Um, so that has to be fixed. But that's exactly where it is. It's it's to improve sight lines, and they took up a parking space, and there were three racks there. Okay, I'll, I'll be interested because I'll go down and take a look at it. But the thing is, if it's done appropriately, you should have to bolt it down. So it should be something that is easily positioned and can movable too. So if it's going to, you know, because if we putting bolt into asphalt is not a big deal, um, but we also want to make sure that it's something that is um, we can make adjustments if necessary, you know, to, to make, just to make sure that it's used, but you're right. Like, it should be something that's your bike's in danger because if you attach it to something, that's not appropriate. That's good feedback. And we are using um, 
what we're generally referring to as French barricades in some of these areas. And I think those can be used for bike parking um, and, and are in some certain situations. So I think it's really good feedback to consider the bike parking opportunities in these areas. Yeah, and we do need to be careful about like the French barricades they're really appropriate. I mean, people use them again. Like, so the, the, the idea is that people say, well, you can lock to anything. And that's true, but it's not necessarily safe then because people think, oh, my lock, my bike's locked, but they didn't lock it appropriately because they really didn't have a place, the appropriate thing to lock it to. They didn't get stolen or everything but your front wheel got stolen. You know, So that's not going to help anything. Or then it was in the way. And so we've had issues, I don't know about here in Nashville, but other places too, where then they lock it to something that they're not supposed to lock it to because that's the assumption to lock it to anything. And then the police come and take it away because they say, well, it wasn't locked the right thing, but there was no signage or anything that to say where it should have been locked to. So we need to have a good strategy is what I'm trying to say about bike parking in all these areas. And so I can certainly help with that. I'm sure that Asheville and Bikes can help with that too, but we shouldn't just say in one of those areas, oh, let's throw a rack here or people can lock to this or this or this without really thinking it through because it ends up then being a deterrent rather than an encouragement. Well, Randy, we appreciate that feedback. And I, I, I think um, I'd really look forward to hearing what your um, thoughts were on, on that Biltmore Avenue one, if that's in line with, with what your thoughts were or if not, but ideally, you know, there should be that parking wherever we put these zones and then there should be safe connector routes to so where we can flow and it's good for commerce and it's good for safety. Um, so I'm glad to know that you guys are, are looking at that. Thank you. But I want to keep us moving because uh, we're getting we're getting kind of past five and we've got a couple other things left. Oh, geez. I'm looking a little slow. Can you guys hear me? Oh, geez. Yeah, we, I can hear you. Michael. Yeah, I can hear you too. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Um, all right, then I, I'm, I'm really happy with these updates uh, on this. This is fantastic news. Um, if you ask me this, you know, if we were going to be able to do any of this uh, just a few months back, it, it would have just been – uh, a very low probability. So I'm just I'm happy to know that there's always a half glass full with with any tragedy. Uh, COVID-19 has definitely been a tragedy for this country and and the globe. But you know, kudos to to staff and Asheville for for making lemons out of lemonade on this one. Um. All right. So we are up to uh, the update on NCDOT. And that's going to be uh, Jessica and Dan. Dan, are you here? Do you want me to do it? Or if you're here, you can take it over. Okay, sure. <laughs> happy to do that. Uh, so the COVID-19 um, crisis um, caused the state's revenues for transportation to drop um, significantly, primarily the gas tax revenues. Um, and those gas tax revenues are used for a lot of different NCDOT operations um, and including providing their match to federal funds. Um, and so that's caused a cash flow issue. The, the legislature sets a minimum balance for NCDOT and they can't spend below that. And so they have dropped below that. And so how that impacts us is that um, because all of our federally funded projects, the funds flow through NCDOT, we are um, not only the city of Asheville projects, but just all the, all the state projects in Asheville um, are all in the same boat, which is that they are, um, delayed and um, the, the state doesn't have any matching funds on our city of Asheville projects the, and the federal funds are secure and are still available to us. Um, just we don't have a mechanism for getting them other than 
getting them through into the IT. And we've looked at other avenues for receiving federal funds directly, and um, there really aren't any other remedies to that. Um, and uh, in the materials, you can see the list of, of our city of Asheville projects that have been affected by that. Um, so essentially anything that was already out to bid, under contract, um, that kind of thing could continue on its current schedule. Everything else is um, frozen for the time being. Um, working with the um, French Broad River Metropolitan Planning Organization um, and NCDOT, there are a, a possibility that the state will be able to allow a small number of projects to, to continue. Um, and so the leadership of the MPO got together and to discuss it and ask the city for input on which projects we would continue. And our, um, our recommendation was, was the Nasty Branch Greenway and the Antiora Boulevard sidewalks. And those two primarily because um, of timing issues. Those are the ones that are close to being ready to go. And um, uh, some of the others may, the cash crunch issue might resolve by the time, um, by the time they're ready. So uh, the MPO leadership did meet and Region-wide, they are recommending the Nasty Branch Greenway and uh, Riverside Drive, Town of Woodland Greenway, NC251 um, to proceed uh, on schedule. So we're still waiting to hear how that plays out. And um, But uh, for now, it's, it's a waiting game. I did see where the... Um, in the legislature, the House has um, passed a spending bill that includes transportation infrastructure. I don't know whether it will get through the state Senate, but um, that could be part of the puzzle uh, that, that helps solve it. Happy to answer any questions. Okay. Well, we, we appreciate the update on that very much. This is kind of a, we're definitely in flux right now, so it's nice to, to get some info on that. Um, do we have any, any comments, questions, guys? I want to keep us moving. Okay. Uh, is, does that conclude Dan and uh, Jessica? Yeah, I think so. And okay. The crown is up next. She knows a lot about the issue too, so she may include some of that in hers. Okay. Um, so are we ready to move on to uh, this one on Greenway? So I'm ready if you are. Okay, Lucy, that sounds great. Take it away. I'm really interested in this one. This one uh, uh, is right next to my, my uh, home here in Oakley, so I'm, I'm personally interested. Okay, great. Uh, Janet, I need for you to stop presenting so I can bring up the presentation. And um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lucy Crown. I'm the Greenway Planner in the Transportation Department. And let me bring up my presentation for you. Today, I want to talk with you about the Swannanoa River Greenway. Um, for the past year, we've been working on uh, two different studies in the corridor um, to take a look at uh, implementation. And so the goals of this presentation is to give you a comprehensive knowledge of what we've learned and present the uh, opportunities and constraints that we found and what decision we made moving forward to use with our bond funds. 
Uh, before we get started, I just need to give you a brief um, background on how we do greenway planning. Uh, we work with a master plan that gives us uh, the different corridors in the city that um, in the city of Asheville happen to be 21 of them. And uh, the Swannanoa Greenway is this one right here that is highlighted in bright green. It's about seven and a half miles long. Um, it starts where the Rad Tip project ends at Amboy Road and goes through um, Meadow Road. It crosses Biltmore Avenue here, uh, Tunnel Road here, and enters into the East Asheville neighborhood area where the municipal golf course is and the Azalea Park area, which is comprised of the WNC Nature Center, the Rec Park, and uh, the, the Lewis Soccer Complex. And then continues still to the city's edge um, meeting Tunnel Road in the OT area. So the corridor in its entirety is seven and a half miles long. As a side note, the DOT is looking at a road project on the Meadow Road area right here um, but I won't be talking about that today. I will be talking about the two studies that we did in the middle section from Biltmore Avenue to Azalea Park here. Uh, background of Swannanoa River Greenway is it is a very important greenway in our master plan. Uh, the Swannanoa and the French Broad Rivers are really the spine of our master plan. It is also within the county's greenway master plan. Um, they call it the Wilma Dykeman Greenway, but it is uh, the same alignment as our greenway. And uh, the Wilma Dykeman Riverway Plan is uh, guidelines that help promote and give uh, suggestions on how to do best practices for riverfront redevelopment. Um, and the Swannanoa Greenway area is within the Wilma Dykeman Riverway. It's in the regional trail plan that the MPO is currently planning, which right at this time anyway is called the Hellbender Trail and it is part of the Fonta Flora State Trail. So um, on a number of levels from state to municipal governments are this greenway is a particularly important one. It's also um, the home of a really important transportation corridor. So it is a very important east-west corridor for the um, East Asheville area um, where the neighborhoods in this area will uh, travel um, down Swannanoa River Road to get to the downtown area and over to the River Arts District in West Asheville. It is much more convenient than get, going down to get on 40 or going on 240. It is the preferred route of first responders when they are coming from the East Asheville neighborhoods to the hospital, let's say. And it is um, a great corridor for walking and biking because being on a river um, bed corridor, it's very flat, which is a really nice thing in our mountainous community. And it is the area of a future bus route. According to the transit master plan, it would go online in 2025 and it would run eastbound on Thompson Street. The last background bit that I need to give you before we get into the studies is that we know that the Swannanoa River is and the streets on both sides of it being Swannanoa River Road and Thompson Street are all within a floodplain. Parts of it are in within the floodway. And um, if it's not in the Swannanoa River floodway, it's in the Ross Creek floodplain up here. So as I said, we've had two studies that we were working on last year. Uh, the, on the west side was a corridor study that is within the project area between Biltmore Avenue and 
I usually tell people Tunnel Road or where Lowe's is on Tunnel Road, but actually it ends at the end of Thompson Street at the intersection of Glendale and Thompson. And the second uh, project, which is the focus of our bond funds, starts where the corridor study ends and uh, goes through the Swannanoa River area and ends just after Mana Food Bank, where it would cross over the river to get to the city-owned park area of Asalia. So um, these studies will be available on our project page next week. Uh, the corridor study looks like this, and it, it cost $67,000. We were able to do this with a grant from the DOT bike ped division. Uh, a corridor study is very much like a feasibility study, but it takes a broader view on how it can fit into other plans, such as the comprehensive plan, how it impacts land use, uh, and uh, other factors like that. The uh, schematic designs that were done for the bond projects is part of a $3.6 million uh, bond from the transportation bond. And uh, it was looking at the, the typologies that we can use through this section of the Greenway Corridor and other details. Uh, the goal of the study that we just finished was to get to the point where we understand what is the most feasible way to implement that greenway from Glendale to Azalea Park. So some details about the corridor study um, from Biltmore to the end of Thompson Street. We really looked at a lot of different alternatives. Entering into the study, we had our expectations set on using Thompson Street since it is a city-owned road, um, turning it into a one-way street and using half of the roadbed as the Greenway Corridor. Um, one of the things that would make that work very successfully would be to put a vehicular bridge over the river at Stoner Street, where there is a very large apartment complex that was recently built. And that would have definitely improved the um, congestion and flow uh, concerns that are in the area. Uh, but looking at it a little deeper, the ability to put a, a bridge over the river in that area was very problematic. Um, nothing is impossible, but it was going to take heaps and heaps and heaps of money to be able to build a bridge that would um, be higher than the flood area, and it would have taken a lot of land um, to be able to do it. So moving away from that, we looked at the Swannanoa River Road area. Um, it definitely became the most feasible option for us to work with. Um, and the fact that the DOT is working on a project, which I will talk about in a few slides, makes it even more cost efficient for the city with their complete streets policy that's in place now. A multi-use path along the road would be something that they would pay the majority, if not all of the expenses for. Um, and just as a side note, we also looked at um, a place away from the river um, in the section from Biltmore to Glendale, which was following the railroad track right away um, on the south side of this um, office campus and the other businesses along Thompson Street. Um, it's, not, it's not a very feasible option at the end of our studies. So our biggest takeaways from our corridor study is that Swannanoa River Road is the most feasible option. Um, there's more room to move away from the river there um, and fiscally is, has the best cost efficiencies. 
And as I said, Thompson Street had more constraints than we had anticipated. And without the vehicular bridge, it just was not gonna be a product that anyone would have been happy with. Uh, another point that um, we ended with at the end of our studies is the fact that the um, intersection at Biltmore where you cross over to Meadow Road is not within the scope of work of our studies and it is also not within the scope of work of the Meadow Road improvements that the DOT is doing. Um, it is tricky uh, to figure out how to cross Biltmore. Um, it would possibly require a mid-block crossing, which the DOT is never um, very in favor of trying to do. Um, but even if we took a straight shot from Meadow Road to Bryson, which hooks into Swannanoa River Road, there would be a uh, need for future studies to figure out exactly how that would work. Moving on to the schematic designs of the bond project. Um, as I said, we looked at uh, a lot of different alternatives on how to get through the plan. Uh, the, the presentations that you have in your agenda have links to these reports, so you can take a look at them in your own convenience. I just put some of the pictures in the presentation to give you an idea of the sections that we looked at. Um, within the, the section that we have studied, we would be traveling under Wood Avenue and traveling under the I-240 bridges instead of trying to cross over them. So um, that we've got uh, a general idea of what needs to be done as far as engineering and design to be able to do both of those. And as we move farther down Swannanoa River Road after Tunnel Road, after um, the Walmart intersection at Bleachery Road, uh, we would be working definitely on the area from between Swannanoa River Road and the Swannanoa River. One of the advantages of that is that we own many of those parcels, which we purchased in 2004 after the hurricanes with FEMA buyout money. So that will make it um, much easier to implement than the other side of the river. Um, so working on the Swannanoa River Road side of the river on the majority of both sections that we've studied is the most feasible way to do that. Um, fiscally, again, it has the best cost efficiencies if we work with the DOT designing a multi-use path along the Swannanoa River Road where they would be helping us pay for that and taking on a great cost share of that, if not the entire cost. Speaking of the DOT projects, I just want to touch on them briefly. Um, they follow exactly our project areas. In fact, we share um, a consultant who is on our team as well as theirs uh, who are doing the hydrology studies primarily. And they've been an enormous help as acting as a connective tissue between both projects, um, keeping both teams aware of the findings and opportunities and constraints of both projects. But um, the one on the west side is um, a project that has a budget of about $23 million. And the one on the east side, it has a budget of almost $11 million. Currently, um, and that this is, uh, let's say, as far as I knew a few months ago before we went into COVID lockdown, um, they were conducting hydrology studies in the area. Uh, their timeline for these projects were the same for both projects, and um, they were finishing up their designs in 2020, which we now know is going to be delayed um, land acquisition was scheduled for 2022 and construction was uh, slated for 2024. And at this point, I would bet good money that all of that is delayed. 
Knowing that the DOT is doing hydrology studies now, we've asked them to consider a couple of scenarios that would make uh, not only a better greenway product, but a better road product. Um, if you were to notice as you're driving down Swannanoa River Road, the road is a very old style road and um, it is built very close to the top of bank of the river in some areas and very close to buildings on the other side. Um, it's a very flood prone area as I've told you and their hydrology studies have seen that even just resurfacing the roads would cause a rise in the floodplain, um, which is um, something that they can't do without um, a lot of further studies. So um, we've asked them to take a look at two scenarios and I want to stress that these are extremely conceptual plans. There's been no more um, studies in depth than a mere scratch of the surface, but um, the two concepts, and um, I'm not expecting you to be able to see or comprehend these pictures, but if you look at, in your own time, these links will open them up for you. Um, one is a low impact concept where they would push the road out of the floodplain and that would make room for the greenway between the road and the river, possibly using the existing road bed. Um, but a, another scenario is called the resiliency concept, which would in fact make, uh, in theory, I'm not gonna say in fact, would make a um, better road project for them moving their road far away from the floodplain and would also allow us to have the greenway out of the floodplain. Um, it would require a lot of land acquisition, but still have room for redevelopment and possibly as a future and separate project, flood storage. So in this picture here, the blue areas would be a flood storage area. Um, which would help immensely in this river corridor with flooding. Um, the orange area is possible redevelopment areas and these green areas would be um, areas that are within the floodplain um, and not conducive for good redevelopment um, that we would suggest would should remain as open space. And then the third project that's going on is um, being done by Mother Nature. I'm gonna see if I can show you this video of Swannanoa River Road Corridor um, during a heavy rain incident. Um, I'm gonna stop it right here. Uh, this is Swannanoa River Road. This is Caledonia and the tobacco warehouse already underwater. Um, the utility lines here are right at the edge of pavement. And as you can see, there are sections that are uh, very, very close to the top of bank. These trees are um, on the top of bank. Um, some of them are already falling into the river because the banks have eroded with the repetitive flooding that we've had in the last couple of years. And as you can see on the other side here, this is Thompson Street. It floods a lot as well, but it goes underwater after the um, Swannanoa River Road does. So this is no surprise to the city um, or the MPO. Uh, the MPO has been doing multi-county assessments of uh, climate change impacts. And this these images um, are showing the area between Biltmore Avenue and Glendale. Um, this is a vulnerability and risk assessment of the um, buildings and parcels in that area. And as you can see, most of them are bright red, which means they are very high on the vulnerability and risk scale.
these pictures show the complications that we were having um, with the terrain and the physical space of Thompson Street. Um, this picture right here doesn't quite do it justice, um, showing how close the road is to the top of bank. If you were to look at this from the other side, this entire area is undercut with erosion and the banks are falling in and our road is showing signs of um, crumbling and falling apart as well. Um, it is such a serious issue that Duke Energy is moving their um, transmission lines. So those are the very expensive high voltage lines that they need metal um, poles for, um, not the little distribution lines on the creosote poles. Um, and they cost over a million dollars each to move. And they are moving every one of them from the river side of the road to the other side of the road, uh, because they know that the Riverside of the road is in danger of rapid erosion. Uh, the other difficulty or constraint that we're having is rapid development on Thompson Street. Uh, these are some brand new, really nice apartments um, that um, are complete on the first phase and they're nearly complete on the second phase. Adding to the list of challenges besides the spatial constraints and the rapid development and, and repeat flooding is uh, the public perception of if we were to work with the DOT's project, we would need to use our bond money outside of our uh, window of time commitments that we've made to our citizens. The um, projects are to be finished by 2023 and the DOT at the soonest at this point would be constructing in 2024. Um, they, uh, there's, it is not illegal for us to push our funding at, to a future year outside of the window, but we really don't want to do that um, for public perception and uh, because we really want to do a good job getting our projects finished within the bond window. So timing and public uh, perception and funding, especially if we're looking at uh, the resiliency plan, which would require quite a bit of land acquisition, are all um, added stresses to getting these sections of the Greenway built. So we're in project negotiations with the DOT and we um, are in agreement that this is more than a greenway project on the Swannanoa River roadside. It's an opportunity to address important, this transportation corridor that's very report, um, important and address it in a more resilient way. Um, we'll know more later. So knowing that uh, we really should wait for the DOT's road project to move forward with the multi-use paths, uh, we took a look at the things that we can use the bond funds for um, in the meantime. And there is a certain section of the Greenway that is completely off-road. And we know that we would be responsible for paying 100% of that, of that section. So this image right here shows a few stages of the bond related uh, study area. And um, we have suggested that we move in three phases. Um, stage one or phase one would be the section that we can build now. And I will go into that on the next slide. Stage two, these purple lines, are what we would wait for the DOT to be ready to construct with us. And stage three would be um, after Mana Food Bank needing a pedestrian bridge to cross the river to enter into the Azalea Road complex. So this is the section that we will be using the 
um, bond project four. Um, it is starts at Glendale Avenue at the end of Thompson Street. It follows the river on the south side. So the Swannanoa River Road's on the north side of the river. We would be building a greenway on the other side of the river at this section. Um, and it would follow uh, to Wood Avenue. At this point, we would have a spur uh, for people to be able to get up to South Tunnel Road where there is a bus stop. Uh, but the main greenway will continue underneath I-240 and hook up with the existing greenway at the Riverbend shopping area where Walmart is and continue um, to the end of that property where there is a bridge on Bleachery Road that hooks up to Swannanoa River Road. There's a bus stop here as well. Um, and that will, we just passed at uh, the council meeting, not yesterday, but two weeks ago, the approval for us to continue working with our consultants to um, make this project shovel ready. It will take 18 months of engineering, permitting and land acquisition, and we expect to begin construction in 2022. Another section that we'll be looking at during stage one is a natural surface trail that would begin after, if you know where Cheddar's Restaurant is in the Riverbend shopping area, uh, it is the end of the Riverbend Greenway and um, following the river on the south side, we would make a natural surface trail here that ends up going through a very big open field at the River Ridge condos and eventually terminates at Fairview Road and Swannanoa River Road. So it could easily hook up with the uh, multi-use path on Swannanoa River Road, um, making a great hiking loop here. So not so conducive for bikes and such, but um, definitely good for walking and hiking. And that is the end of my pro my presentation. Do you have any questions? I just, want to, I just want to say thanks, Lucy, so much. I know this has been a huge project, and it's you know it's very complicated, and you've gone through many iterations, and in so you've had to make tons of adjustments, and it's it's made a you're doing a great job. So I know it's not been easy at all, and and it's. You you've not you could have taken the easy way out a couple of times and you haven't done it. You've always looked to see what was best and how we can best utilize our dollars and and then and make a trail that's gonna you know work most the best for most people. So thanks so much for all the hard work on it. Thanks. I have to give credit to my partners in the capital project department, Vinny Sullivan, who I know is silenced online and can help me answer questions, and our consultants have been great. But as I said, this greenway corridor is Along with the French Broad River, these are the two most important greenways that we need to build, and we need to make them really good products. And it's got a lot of people on them. I'd also like to say thank you, Lucy, and, and your team, because um, you know it couldn't it couldn't come quick enough for for the residents over here on the side of town. We're some of the most hemmed in uh, folks, and and um, in Asheville, we have a got a lot of need over here so it'll be it'll be really fantastic when that happens and we look forward to it thank you you bet um okay well uh let's let's keep moving i think that was the end of presentations we're on to unfinished business multimodal commission 2019 annual retreat um i'm not exactly sure what we're what we're going to discuss, but I'm hoping Jessica can fill us in. Um, nothing necessarily to discuss. I just wanted to keep that on there um, for for reference. Okay. Um, if anybody's got any any comments on on the retreat, um, please make them. Otherwise, we'll keep going. Okay. Um, so on to general committee updates. Uh, it's a little different this time uh, because many of our committees that we serve on are not functioning right now. Um, and I'd like to go on record saying that uh, that's a huge uh, 
uh, piece of this meeting that's missing if we're not able to to go and, and meet with our, our subcommittees uh, we're, we're really not doing um, we're not meeting our full potential uh, as, as commission members so we look forward to the opportunity to, to start those meetings back up um, but uh, it looks like um, we do have a, a little bit from the transit committee uh, or Elizabeth uh, is, there, is there anything you were prepared for on this Um, I'll just say we included a memo and on-time performance information and um, compliance reports from the last three months. And in the interest of time, I encourage you to read the transit monthly memo because we included a lot of uh, updates and information about various projects that are going on. Um, that we don't really have time to talk about today, but there's stuff about the transit center renovation grants that we've applied for and a lot of other good stuff in there. Okay. Um, does anybody have any anything uh, that they'd like to, to comment on relative to the their committees? I know that they haven't been functioning in, in a official capacity, but I know that we've still been liaising with them um, so if anybody would like to, to, to bring us up to speed or not, that's fine. I, I think that, um, sorry, I had work going on outside. I couldn't hear anything. So yeah, I don't have it in front of me, but I, I emailed everyone on multimodal and I can make it public. We can make it part of the notes, just kind of the basic transit updates. But I think we have a lot to get through in transit. It's too late in the meeting. Um, so I guess I would say, let's hope the transit committee meets in July. We can kind of parse through this and dive deep into all this information. I will be actually the chair of transit until July because we haven't been convened. So I will be remaining for that meeting to transition in a new chair. Um, so I'm hoping we can dive deep into all the transit information. Yeah, and, and I'd like to, to make sure that that gets prioritized um, on, on our next uh, meeting. This one obviously has gone long, but we haven't met in months. Um, so we'll, I, I'm hoping we can get a, 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 do a deep dive on some of these committees uh, on our next go around. Is there anybody else? Joe? Yeah, hey, Michael. Um, Elizabeth, I guess maybe just a quick, I was reading through some of the transit stuff and you know, I don't know, it, it could be that I missed this way back, but no, no, I just saw something on the Okay, go digital ahead. digital signage project. I was just curious why UNCA was one of the locations for the digital signage. Um, I, just a question, like why they all have phones, they all stare at them all day long. Perhaps there's a better place for a digital signage than at UNCA for the bus. Maybe. Um, well, there used to be one there. So we wanted to, be, there used to be one there and there used to be one at the Piscadio Apartments. And so we went, just wanted to reinstall that. And um, I hear what you're saying. I think that, you know, there's still a lot of folks out there that don't have, have smartphones. And we just want to make sure that we've got um, some of our more popular stops covered. And, and we just wanted to replace what we used to have. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it just, it was a question kind of in light of everything that's going on. Is it maybe the best place, the best use for that money to be there? And um, yeah, that was, like I said, just curious as much as anything. Okay, uh, thanks, Joe. Um, let's uh, let's keep moving. Uh, let's see. So staff updates is what we've got next. Uh, Jessica, are we, do are we, you want to, what do you want to do with these? Um. I don't really have anything to speak to. There's some, uh, there's been some recent committee meetings for the aesthetics committee for I-26. And um, so we've attached the most recent agenda from that. And then um, also attached is a staff report memo that Ken wrote and, and uh, gave to the council a couple weeks back about the um, I-26 project, so that's there for your information. And then um, the list of projects spreadsheet has been updated with recent information from staff. Okay, very good. Um, uh, just 
I just had a question real quick on the Biltmore McDowell, which I'm going to ask about that every meeting. Um, it says that the under contract negotiations and the project would start in the spring of 2020 and it's summer of 2020. So I don't know if that's being held up by the COVID stuff or if it just hasn't been updated, but there's it just doesn't seem current right now on the update. Um, yeah, I guess Dan didn't get a chance to update that part, but yes, it's, um, it's on hold. We do have someone under contract. I mean, it's not completely on hold. We have somebody under contract. They're doing some of the preliminary data collection, but one of the things is that we usually do in data collection is, uh, you know, take traffic volume counts and things of that nature, but we don't want to do that right now since it's not really reflective of of the norm, um, but there are certain things that we'll probably try to move forward on, including public outreach and, and potentially some like stakeholder meetings with folks in the adjacent areas like Mission and um, AB Tech and, and so on. So we're trying to move things forward that we can at this point in time. Okay, um, anybody else, we good? Okay, um, so it looks like uh, we got future agenda items. Um, there's some that are listed here, but um, I don't know how we want to go through this. Do you, do you want me to just read them out, uh, Jessica? Um, it, it's up to you, Michael. They're ones that we kind of had on the list for quite some time, and I don't, I don't really have any uh, updates on any of them at this point other than what I talked about recently or already about the right-of-way closure stuff. Okay. Um, these all look good to me. The only one that I'd like to see added um, would be, and I think we should, we might've been able to discuss it today, but I think Kim's already off the call, uh, but we need to figure out uh, what we're gonna do to advertise uh, her position as well as any other vacancies that we've got. So I just wanna make sure that's in the pipeline to get that done. Um, and then if anybody else has got anything that they'd like to see on the agenda, Joe? Yeah, I've got a couple, Michael. Um, one I had emailed you about was, I think it would be wise, especially even in thinking about trying to bring on new members for the subcommittees and multimodal to revisit the idea of changing the meeting date. Um, it, it seems like it has, kind of come up a few times and I, I think some other committees are trying to look at it you know the especially the ones that meet in the afternoon are perhaps problematic as far as grabbing a bigger audience uh, of potential community volunteers um, and another one I wanted to to maybe get on the future agenda um, and this kind of ties into the right of not necessarily into the right away thing Jessica but we've talked about it before <clears throat> um, is and this is something I know that planning is looking at as well as is the usage fee for the public right of way for developers. And, you know, I mean, this ties specifically to that RS project, um, you know, potential that of some lost revenue there um, if we have a better plan in place. And I, I know that's going and maybe it's been delayed, but just to get an update on where that's at, if that's still happening or what. So those are the two things I think would be great to see on the future agenda. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, we are still working on that. Yeah, and thanks, Joe. I, I would like to see some uh, more equitable time for this too, because not everybody can just get off at, at three o'clock in the afternoon to, to show up to these meetings. So, um, Jessica, perhaps after uh, you know behind the scenes, we can figure out what our options are and report back at our next meeting. And, and just Michael, real quick, too, you mentioned about having the police at a future meeting too, so we can talk about a number of things, including maybe their philosophy on time allocation for public safety and that kind of thing too. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate that's a that's a, a big concern of mine. I think it's it's omnipresent right now, and it's very important uh, for obvious reasons that that we have an opportunity to to have a dialogue with APD. Um, I, I think. Uh, I think that'd be really valuable. So I appreciate that. And we'd like to, again, extend that that uh, invitation out and we'll, we'll continue to send that invitation out um, if, we, um, if we're not taking up on it. it. In addition to having them come and talk about that, I had mentioned it, I can't remember how long ago, but it would be nice to invite them to to discuss the speed camera issue. Perhaps that maybe is a touchier subject right now, but I really think that, you know, 
it would be good to get their perspective on it. If they're going to come, let's get as much info out of them as we can. I agree. I think there's a lot of a lot of questions regarding uh, traffic calming and speed that um, I don't have answers to. I've gotten mixed answers from various people. Um, so I'd like to get it uh, straight from the from the source. Uh, I think that's another reason why it's valuable to have them at our meeting. Agreed. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Jessica, for trying to coordinate that. And and Randy, future chair, vice chair. Okay. Is there anything else? And obviously, guys, uh, if, if you don't have anything now, but you think about it later, I've got an open door policy virtually, obviously. Um, just let me know and, and we'll, we'll get these things on there. Um, if not, uh, then this would be the normal portion where we ask for public comment. Uh, I think we, we had an opportunity for recorded comment, but I don't think it was advertised too well. So do we have anything at this point or probably not still? Okay. Um, well, let's try to be better on that next time. I really want to get more public input, um, because it's otherwise, why are we here? Um, so our next meeting will be on my birthday, July 22nd. So you've all been put on notice. <laughs> um, it'll be at, uh, for now, three o'clock. Um, this says first floor of the conference room, city hall. Is that accurate? Yeah. Or TBD? Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to cross that out. So yeah. it'll be virtual at this point. Um, okay. And you have to bring your own birthday hat, Michael. Okay, I've already got it. I'll be working on it. Hey, Jessica, I'm just curious. I know next week planning and zoning is having our first meeting in a while over at the Civic Center. Is that maybe going to be a dry run for the rest of these committees, perhaps? I have no idea. That's the first I've heard of that. Um, yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with the timeliness of voting and the whole, you know, if you can't really do a if it, it's like the city council, if they do a vote virtually, it doesn't actually get recorded until the next meeting and the planning and zoning issues, it kind of needs to be done and moved next. So, um, yeah. I mean, I know they, they sent us a, a layout of that banquet hall and it's, they, you know, they've definitely thought through it. So I just wasn't sure if that was perhaps a precursor. Possibly. I know that the quasi-judicial which is what PNZ is, is, is a priority. So I'm sure that has something to do with it. Um, and also, if you haven't seen, the governor just extended our face queue for another three weeks. Um, and we're all required to wear face masks, which I'm sure we all already have been doing. <laughs> yeah, we should be. Um, all right, folks. Well, um, I appreciate everybody sticking in there. It's, it, was, it was a long one. It was a marathon today, but we had a lot uh, to get through, and I think we did. Uh, it was really exciting to, to be able to get updated on the things we did, and I'm, I'm really excited, excited about the team that I get to work with. Um, so I guess um, if anybody's got any comments, I'll take them, but if not, if not, I uh, will uh, move to adjourn without any objection. We'll uh, we'll gavel this out. There you go. Okay.